subordinate it, keep it locked in the basement of my mm -hmm. psyche through in just an incredibly brutal work ethic my whole life. Yeah. I, was, I was raised in a home with an impending sense of doom around each corner, yeah. you know, a lot of fear. Uh, it's in my DNA. And my remedy, which I learned very early on from my father, was to just work all the time, and that subordinated the anxiety. And then uh, something happened in January. I think it was a combination of yeah. carrying so many families through COVID, mm -hmm. all of those funerals, all of that yeah. collective anxiety that was a part of my congregation, which you know is pretty large, so mm -hmm. it was a, a heavy load, and steering the institution through. And then um, I, I made a decision to help someone privately who I believe deserved a second chance, yeah. it became public that I helped that person. And some people disagreed with my decision um, uh, about whether or not forgiveness was merited. And then I had this, this rush of fear of, that I was gonna be canceled by my own huh. community. And this just flung open that door huh. <clears throat> and triggered a, a paralyzing, paralyzing uh, ah. period of anxiety. I mean, we can see <coughs> in your eyes, we can mm -hmm. hear it in your voice that this was something that was debilitating. And as Hoda said, you are the healer. Yeah, yeah. So how did you heal yourself in that moment? Well, it got so bad. I lost 10 pounds. Um, I, you know, was barely functioning. And I needed help. Mm -hmm. So I asked for help. I went to a very good psychiatrist. Uh, I got for the first time in my life, the proper medication. Huh. And after a few months, I woke up one day, someone asked me, how are you? And I said, great. Yeah. And I said, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I started to realize what a normal human level of anxiety is uh. all about and how much better my life was. And all I had to do was get help. Yeah, and yeah. speak it out loud to say it because what you said, which is I think a lot of people are doing right now, is they, they carry it. You bury it and you carry it and you continue yes. because you're productive and yes. you have a happy family and you can keep going and going and going. Right. And there are some who would say like, well, why not continue? Like, yeah. what's the harm in continuing the way you had been for Well, a you can time? only keep that basement door locked for so long. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the, these underlying mood disorders are banging on the ceiling with a broomstick yeah. and eventually, here. Eventually they come out and, and then you start to realize the high wire act you've been performing your whole life yeah. to, to keep it under control and to carry it. And I made the decision to come out about this because first of all, uh, I believe in a whole system of beliefs that says we can change, that yeah. we can be better, that life can be better, that the world can be better. And I thought to myself, how can I not lead by example? Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of celebrities have come out about this, but we don't really relate to celebrities right. and see ourselves yeah. in them. Right. And so I decided to do it because, because anxiety plagues clergy, school teachers, yeah. Yeah. car repair workers, yeah. you know, uh, everyone. Moms and dads. Moms and dads, yeah. four out of 10. Yeah. Four out of 10 of us in this country. And, you know, there's an aversion to getting help. Yeah. I need these because my vision's not 2020. Nobody cares. Yeah. If I had diabetes, I wouldn't think twice about taking insulin. Yeah. Mental illness somehow. There's stigma. Different. There's a stigma. Yeah. It's seen differently. And if we can just get past that and, and realize as I like to put it, store bought is fine. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> store bought is fine. Yeah. We all, we all can change and, and have more beautiful and more yeah. meaningful yeah. lives. And also, uh, you know, you've helped all of us. Yeah. So many watching your whole, your whole um, temple yeah. find the beauty in their lives. And yeah. we're just so proud that you let yourself find yes. that same beauty. I, I offer it to, to all of us and, and you well, know, I hope- Well, thank you for offering it to yourself. Well, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore.
the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends at Today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's your shop Today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Next guest has a new way to celebrate yourself every morning. Right. Amel Robbins is a motivational speaker, podcaster, and the best-selling <laughs> author behind the high five the, behind the five second rule. <laughs> the new book is called The High Five Habit, and she's here to tell us what that means. Mel, good morning. Thank good you. Good morning. Number two on Amazon. That's so right. Wow, congrats. Boom. So let's talk about this high five habit. In short, it's about cheering yourself on in all aspects of your life, yes. right? Yes. How, why is this so important? Well, first of all, the last 18 months, I think, has punched everybody in the face. We all <laughs> have higher anxiety. We feel uh, discouraged. We feel low energy. And so you have to know how to pick yourself back up when something like this happens. You need more positive energy. And this goes deeper than just cheering for yourself. There is so much science behind high-fiving yourself in the mirror that is mind-blowing. Huh. I started doing this because I was overwhelmed by my life. I was overwhelmed during quarantine and I couldn't think of anything positive to say to myself in the mirror. And one morning I just all of a sudden high five the exhausted, overwhelmed, tired woman I saw staring back at me and I felt this shift in energy. I did it for a month. I posted one photo online and more than a hundred people posted photos within an hour of themselves and with their kids of all ages, of all sizes, races, religions, doing it around the world. And I thought, well, that's crazy. Maybe I'm not the only one who needs to feel lifted up. So I did a year-long research project. The science is nuts, you guys. Mm. So let's talk about a high five. Okay. You yeah. high five people okay. your entire life. When you yep. high five somebody, what does a high five mean? You're saying, way to go. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yes. You've never high five somebody and said, you're terrible, I hate you, you're a failure. That, right. That is it's true. a positive emotion, right. a positive gesture. All of that programming is in your brain. Ah. It's already there. So the physical cues the mental? Boom. Okay, And I so love that. you can stand in front of the mirror and say, my life is terrible, I'm a failure, I, I'm ashamed of this, that, and the other thing. When you go to high five your reflection, yeah. the subconscious part of your brain overrides what you're thinking. And it programs with your reflection. I believe in you. I that. see you. I love you. So, just, so and it's not. Yeah, you you got. You got it. You don't even have to touch the mirror. A lot of people don't. Okay. Just look at yourself in the mirror for a minute. Okay. Oh, because 91% of women hate how they look. 50% wow. of men and women don't even look at themselves in the mirror. Wow. That's sad. Yeah, yeah. that is sad. But when you look at yourself in the mirror, you're actually staring at another human being. And everybody has a habit right now that is to pick apart or ignore the human being they see. Mm -hmm. it's true. I want you to break it. And so you just look at yourself and think, how do I need to show up for that human being? And then just raise your hand and high five your reflection. Honestly, you I feel it, I do. I know what you're talking about and I will say I was just at a playground in Philadelphia with a bunch of kids and they were doing this like planned recess where every time you lost the game, right? Yeah. Like, so you're out, you get tagged, whatever. You high five the person and the other one tells you, you're awesome. Even though you're out, it's just like an uplifting feeling. Well, you know why? Because every time somebody else gives you a high five, your brain releases dopamine. Mm. And your nervous system gives you a jolt of celebratory energy. This comes from Dr. Daniel Amen, the world's leading expert on the brain. On top of that, there's research about kids. The most motivating force in the world when researchers studied how to push kids through a challenge yeah. is not to tell them they're smart, not to tell them to work harder. It's to give them a high five with no words. Because when you high five mm. a human being, you're saying, I see you, I believe in you, I love you. That's what it's communicating. No, well, I'm going wonderful. to I'm going to fist bump because no, it's the five. same reaction too. Oh, high five. <laughs> it's incredible. The high five <laughs> habit is me. out now.
When Christina De Fiore was a high school sophomore, her life was consumed by schoolwork and competitive dance. I would come home exhausted, and then I would shower right away, eat some dinner, try to cram in a few hours of homework. By that time, it would be midnight, and do it again the next day. And after she sustained a back injury, her life was suddenly turned upside down. I would just say, is this ever going to stop? Is this ever going to get better? When I was afraid she would have to give up dance, um, which she loved. I was afraid that she would sort of lose her passion for school. Sidelined from her passion and her schoolwork floundering, Christina was depressed and struggling. It came down to the fact that really she was suffering from some anxiety. And she's not alone. 17% of kids ages 6 through 17 experience a mental health disorder. Adolescents, teens are going through a lot and reporting a lot of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, suicides. All of this is increasing rather than decreasing. And now some states and school districts are taking action, allowing mental health days as an excused absence for students. In the same way that if you were to experience a stomach ache or a headache, it's going to be incredibly hard to focus in the classroom. The same is true for our students who are experiencing anxiety, who are experiencing depression. They're so distracted. At the forefront of the Mental Health Day movement is former Oregon high school student Haley Hardcastle, who's battled anxiety and depression for most of her life. Outside, I'm like a really overachieving, um, well-adjusted student, but I definitely go through my own struggles. I started my mental health journey when I was only six years old. Her TED Talk on Mental Health Days garnered more than 2.8 million views. Some semesters, I used all of those rest days to the fullest. And in the past two years, Oregon, along with eight other states, have enacted laws allowing mental health days for students. My goal is to make sure we increase the mental health illness awareness um, throughout our communities, no matter what your background is, no matter where you live. The National Alliance on Mental Illness encourages students who feel they need a day off to use that time to rest up, find an activity that brings joy, and seek mental health support. It was a great opportunity to spark a conversation with friends and family about what you're going through. As for Christina, she's now a senior applying for colleges, and she says she's doing much better. She still sees a counselor regularly. She's like, Christina, sometimes you just need to slow down. And I need to hear that from multiple people multiple times to actually take it in. But it is something that's very, very crucial to well-being. So how can we help our kids? Dr. Harold Koplowitz is the president and medical director of the Child Mind Institute. He's also the author of the book. It's called The Scaffold Effect. Good morning. So glad to have you here. I think a lot of parents may be watching and wondering, like, I'm not sure if what my child has is a serious thing yeah. or just a moment in time. Right. And they don't know whether they should be carving out mental health days and seeking counseling or if it's just something that kids go through and can blow, blow over. So pre-COVID, yeah. 17 million kids in the United States had a mental health disorder. And the first or the most popular one happens to be an anxiety yeah. disorder. So it's not just being anxious, it's distress and dysfunction. I'm so uncomfortable that my skin is crawling, yeah, or yeah. I can't stop washing my hands right. even though once was enough, or I can't separate from mom and dad. Yeah. COVID has made it worse for everyone. Okay. So for anxious kids who now have to go back to school and have to separate from their parents, have to put up with social interactions when they were super sensitive, maybe even pathologically self-conscious, this mm. is really tough for a certain mm -hmm. percentage of kids to go back to school. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of us who are delighted to be in person, right. in the studio, in school, hanging out yeah. with my friends. But for a certain percentage, yeah. that 17% or 20% of the population, they're going to struggle. Mm. So we just talked about this mental health day. My mom mm -hmm. actually gave us mm -hmm. those days when we were younger if she just saw that we were exhausted. Yeah. What do you think about the fact that school districts are taking this on? Yeah. Well, I think a sick day is a sick day, right? I mean, one of the psychologists on the piece said, if you have a stomachache or you have a headache, you're entitled to take the day mm -hmm. off. And certainly, if you're so demoralized or you can't get out of bed, what I worry about is that if you're avoiding something. Yeah. So for instance, if you are avoiding separating from your parents and your parents let you stay home, mm -hmm. you're feeding the monster, so oh, to speak. The anxiety is gonna get worse. So that's the telltale sign. Is this just avoidance or is it 
he can't get out of bed. He's just wiped out. And is this a sign, by the way, that it's more than just a little blip? Should I need to go see a mental health professional? A lot of kids are going through horrible anxiety, and a lot of it is social media sparred. Yes. I mean, I get it. Like, yeah. if your friends are either making fun of you or they're leaving you out, taking a mental health day and being you away, can't escape it. yeah, it's always up in you. So, what? How, how do you combat that piece right. of it? So, we did a study during COVID yeah. about problematic internet use. Kids who use the internet six to eight hours a day. Yeah. Uh, and believe me, during COVID, kids were using it a lot more yeah. than that. However, it turns out that if you had ADHD or depression beforehand, yeah. you made your symptoms worse. You have a statement that says self-care is child care. Jen and I were like, <laughs> yeah, yes. For parents, but if yes. you're coming in depleted, you're not going to be able to meet the building. Well, it's the whole idea of being a scaffold, right? If the scaffolding isn't strong, you can't make the building strong. Four things I want everyone watching okay. to do. Sleep at least seven hours a night. Okay. That means turn Netflix yeah. off, stop yeah. looking yeah. at your screen. Number two, eat something green, yeah. okay? Yes. Too many carbs, not yeah. good for you. Yep. Number three, do some exercise, even if it's just a 20 minute walk. Yeah. You don't have to be fit, super fit. And third, do something spiritual. Yeah. So by spiritual, go to church, go to synagogue, yeah. or just sit meditate. and yeah. meditate. Do mindfulness, do calm. You know, it doesn't make a difference whether it's five minutes that grows into 20 minutes, but take that moment. And yeah. that's great modeling for your kids. If it's, your kids see you doing that, they're more likely to boy, do that's it. All yeah. that's I good. know this was such good yeah. advice and your book is filled with so much more. Thank you so Thank much. You. So to check out his book, The Scaffold Effect, head to today.com slash shop. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Boom. Boom. That's just shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Is that ready? Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back. makes me happy. Known for his over-the-top handcrafted masterpieces. All right, give me the buttercream. What's ISIS? Cake Boss star Buddy Velastro stunned fans last September when he posted this photo from a hospital bed with his hand heavily bandaged. Hey, guys. Buddy here. And uh, I had a really bad accident the other day at my house with my hand. What happened with your husband? I don't know. Something with the bowling alley. He's stuck. While bowling with his family at home, Velastro tried to correct the machine's pin setter. My dad was standing right here. He was trying to fix it, and his hand got pinned up against here. His right hand became jammed and was impaled multiple times by a metal rod. He recounted the incident and his first two surgeries with his son last year on Today. It's going to definitely be an uphill battle, and the prayers and the support from all the fans from all over the world has been... It made me feel so special, and um, it makes me want to fight to get better for them. You know, it makes me want to um, be the man that I was. 
Now, five surgeries, and more than a year later, the cake boss says his dominant right hand is at 95%. He came out pretty amazing. He even competed in and won a new season of his competition show, Buddy vs. Duff. Somebody up there is watching me. The star Baker documenting his road to recovery across social media. You know, I really can't squeeze or grip things too much. Which has been anything but a piece of cake. <laughs> Joining us live is the kick boss himself, Buddy Velastro. Buddy, God, it's good to see you. It's good to see you working back in business. Was there a time back there during this time where you wondered to yourself, I wonder if this injury may be a game changer for me where I wouldn't be able to work anymore? Oh, I, absolutely. And again, guys, thanks for having me. But, you know, laying in a hospital bed after I had that surgery, I spent two days in HSS and I really had no, I couldn't feel nothing. I really had no idea what I was going to get back to. You know, I, at that point, I don't think the doctor even knew, you know, um, it was, it was like really scary because that's part of me that I call my inner child. Right. When I when I think about cake boss or I think about these cakes that I make, I think that anything in the world is possible. And then I go and make it happen with my with my hands. You know, this is what I do. And um, I felt like part of that I might not ever be there again. You know, um, it was tough. It was it was not probably until February where I had five surgeries. And thank God for Dr. Carlson and HSS. Um, and Dina, my occupational therapist, worked with me for five months, day and night, to like really get my hand back to normal. But I couldn't make a fist until the middle of February. Now, I was supposed to film Buddy vs. Duff in April. And I said, look, my team was like, Buddy, you still got to do it. Even if you can't do it, you know, all in with your hand, we're here to support you, you know, and you can be more of a coach. Um, but I went in and, and thank God, I feel I'm about 95% back. I don't think I'm going to be a hand model, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and, and I might have to get another surgery, um, over time, but you know, I mean, considering what happened, I mean, I had a huge metal spike through my hand. Mm. The fact that I'm here talking to you guys today, doing what I'm doing, um, and, and listen to technology because it. I had nerve damage and she repaired the nerve. These fingers here for like a year, mm -hmm. I just felt like tingly and asleep. Mm. But now the nerve is starting to regenerate and it actually feels like back to normal. It's so crazy mm. what we could do today in, in technology. And, and you have such a different respect for the doctors. Not that I didn't love and respect them before, but when it, when it happens to you, you just think of all those people who helped you get where you are and, and recover. And, and through COVID, I mean, they really were, were truly heroes. So um, yeah. hats off to the, you know, the whole, all the doctors and nurses and everybody in that industry who really uh, put, the, put, you know, us first all the time. That's great. Yeah. Good to see you, buddy. buddy thank you so much for Congrats, joining man. us. We're happy you're back in business. Yeah, it's good to see you. Take thank care. you. We're, Great to see you guys. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Is that ready? Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. 
Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Back in 2017, news of Bob Harper's heart attack. It's pretty shocking. He was the personal trainer on The Biggest Loser. And he went into cardiac arrest while he was at the gym. Well, now Bob is sharing a powerful and personal project. As part of the Survivors Have Heart program, Bob has taken portraits of those who have also had heart attacks. And this is, this is just a, a first look at some wow, of these portraits beautiful. before they're displayed publicly uh, here in, in New York City in October. Uh, Bob Harper, good to see you, brother. Welcome back. It's good to see you. It's so exciting to see those photos um, yes. out in real life. Like, you guys are the first people to see these photos today. And then, now our audience as well. Yeah. And we've just shown some of these portraits that you've taken for Survivors Have Heart and AstraZeneca, for whom you are a paid spokesperson. What can you tell us about the two other survivors here? Well, what were you trying to portray in the pictures? Tamika and Tasha, they were such good subjects because they came in, and what I wanted to do is really show the power in these women, the, the hope for, uh, for a heart attack survivor right now. Can, they can see these photos and think, you know what? There is life after this. If I've survived this heart attack, I can have a full life that is strong and happy and fulfilling. Yeah. I mean, these women really showed that, and that's what I wanted to capture in the photos. My photographs can tend to be on the darker side, and this time I really wanted to bring uh, a lot of positivity and make them very uplifting, and I'm really happy with how the photographs turned out. Yeah, they're beautiful. And how are you feeling, and how does it feel for you to have a self-portrait and also it being displayed in New York City. Yeah, I tell you, I do not like getting my photograph taken. <laughs> and uh, I decided, well, you know what? Let me just go ahead and put the camera on me. So I set up the tripod and uh, and I took that photograph that you're seeing right now. And uh, you know, it's very, as you, as we all know, when you get your photo taken, it's very, um, it's very personal. personal yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I just tried to really capture who I am in that photograph. And I think I did a pretty good job. Bob, it's World <laughs> Heart Day today. Very yes. appropriate day to have you here, right? And so, you know, I think when you had your heart attack, a lot of us were so stunned. We were used to seeing you on The Biggest Loser. You were the picture of health. So what was it that you learned after that experience? What do you want to tell people about, you know, genetics and also what you learned? Yeah, I think the main thing is people need to really know what their history is mm -hmm. from the inside out. You cannot judge a book by its cover. I mean, when I dropped dead in that gym in Chelsea um, four years ago, yeah. I mean, I looked good. Mm -hmm. You did? Absolutely. <laughs> I looked good, but uh, I did not know what was going on with me. And I think that what's so interesting about Survivors have heart is that it's a full circle right now and the fact that I shared my story with um, all of you and Savannah that one day and then now we're going to have this whole exhibit over at the uh, Flatiron Plaza and I'm really excited on October 22nd and 23rd with these other photographs you're going to see Tamika and Tasha but um, I have three other subjects to another woman and two men and I I've learned so much during this time and I really feel like the main thing that I've learned is that we have to appreciate every single day. Mm -hmm. We have to appreciate right here and right now because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Especially after what's happened over the past mm -hmm. few years. That's right. I want to just ask about you. Every time we see you, you have a new tattoo. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and so, did, and you got a special one also on your... Um, yeah, I did. I um, I got a couple of... Uh, I get tattooed at Smith Street Tattoo Parlor in Brooklyn and uh, and I got like these, um, these hands on my chest, which was literally the most painful tattoo in the world. Thank you, Eli, um, for that. But I also got a heart on my uh, on my leg commemorating that with a nurse because let me tell you, the nurses when I was going through my um, recovery, they were there for me like you would not believe. So I have nothing but mad respect for um, the nurses that helped me. It's great to see you, brother. You know, you look great, by the yeah, way. Well, you. all three of you. Well, thank you very much. Oh, wow. You, my old trainer, Bob Harper. I was Harper. going to say, <laughs> he looks great because of you. Bob, Bob Harper and I worked out a couple years ago. We did. Shortly before the heart attack. Right before my heart attack. I mean, not I'm not going to say. No correlation. No I'm not no correlation. Say there it is. that Craig there had anything is. to do with it. Oh, look, oh, there you are. heck of a workout, my man. Look at you. That was the last time I've been in that gym with Bob. Too. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey guys, I'm Willie Geist, and that is a scene from Young Rock, the NBC comedy about the childhood of Dwayne The Rock Johnson, as told by Johnson while he runs in a fictional presidential campaign. Some people, including many of Johnson's hundreds of millions of Instagram followers, have suggested the magnetic professional wrestler turned Hollywood superstar should consider a real life run for the presidency. His thoughts on that in a moment. Growing up, Johnson bounced around the country as the son of a barnstorming pro wrestler named Rocky Johnson. Dwayne eventually got into the family business and became the biggest star in wrestling, known as the People's Champion. He made his first major appearance in a movie 20 years ago. The Mummy Returns was the beginning of a film career that has put Johnson at the top of the list of Hollywood's highest paid actors for the last two years. Dwayne and I got together recently for a Sunday Today Sunday sit down and now we bring you an extended cut of that interview including a birthday toast with his very own Terramana tequila. I wanted to make sure that the bottle represented its founder. So uh, broad at the shoulders, narrow at the hip. <laughs> The neck's okay. a little thin, though, Dwayne. That neck's a little thin, but there's a little bit of a, you know, some muscle size to the neck there. <laughs> Should we pour a, a little of the Blanco, of the Terramana Blanco, and have a toast? We shall, my brother. Let's do it. So tell me, as we pour this, Dwayne, the story behind this, what gave you the idea? Because I understand it's been a long time coming. It has been a long time coming, but this idea of creating a tequila brand was something that I had thought about... Um, almost 10 years ago, but like with usually with a lot of things that I do, I like to take my time. I don't like to rush things, especially if it's something that I, I really feel passionate about. And I feel like there's an opportunity here to create something for who I like to call my number one boss, the consumer. Hmm. Now I always have to follow that comment up with besides my wife and my daughter, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, you have two kids and a wife too as well. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to creating something, I think uh, uh, that they will enjoy. I just want to take my time. And then years later, here we are on my birthday. But <laughs> I will say before we raise this glass, tomorrow is your birthday, May 3rd. So this is going to be a good toast, brother. A good happy birthday toast to and both I, of us. Well, I appreciate it. And a happy birthday to you, not only on the birthdays, but on the one-year anniversary of Terramana. So cheers to you and That's cheers right. to Terramana. Three birthdays. Here we go. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Cheers. <laughs> you know, Randall, to understand me, you got to understand where I came from. Right in front of you right now is the show Young Rock here on, on NBC, which has done really well. How accurate is it? How close is it to what your young life was? Really, it, it is accurate to the T. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some stories that happen, say, for example, in Nashville, Tennessee, we moved that story to take place in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Something that may have happened in Bethlehem may have now may have shifted to Hawaii, but everything is derived from the truth. And I have had just a, what I used to call and still do a Forrest Gumpian childhood growing up where the intersection of my life, and you know, we've talked about this in the past, I. I my childhood was wild in that I grew up in the world of professional wrestling when wrestling in the 80s and in the 70s was way different than it is today. Uh, they were all based on local territories and local promotions. And a lot of the times, including my father, the wrestlers would live paycheck to paycheck, but they also lived this really interesting life. And what I mean by interesting is there's a term that we have in the wrestling industry. It's called working the gimmick. And working the gimmick is when wrestlers have to be on their character 24 seven. So when you went out and you and I were kids and we went out in the public and we, and we saw, for example, Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah. Well, he was always Sergeant Slaughter. Mm -hmm. We saw, you know, the, the Iron Sheik. He was always the Iron Sheik and all these wrestlers, they were always who they were. Now, what's interesting is th they had to drive Cadillac or Lincoln. They had to look the part, diamonds, you name it. They had to look being a star. But yet the B side and the revelation is once I got back in the car, they drove back to their little apartment mm. and they were still living paycheck to paycheck and they were still doing their best to survive. So it, it was this unique upbringing that I had that converged and intersected with all these amazing heroes of mine in the world of pro wrestling. 
But then, you know, there's a lot of life lessons that I didn't know I was being taught back then that you realize many years later um, that I had been, that I, that had helped shape and groom who I am today. No question. And I don't think everyone, even some of your fans fully appreciate what your childhood was like. I think you lived in like 13 or 14 places by the time you were into high school. And then I love the way you talk about arriving in Nashville from Hawaii. You've already got your driver's license. You're a big dude. I think you might've had a mustache at that point. And these kids in Nashville was like, who, who, who is this guy? I did. So we were evicted uh, off the island in Hawaii. Couldn't pay the rent. Again, paycheck to paycheck. I get to Nashville and I already have a driver's license because in Hawaii, you can get your driver's license when you're 14. Right. So I'm 15. Uh, I go to high school. And at that time, there was a TV show, 21 Jump Street. Oh, yeah. Right. So of undercover high school. Johnny Depp. Uh, yeah. Johnny Depp. And they were all convinced, Willie, and this is not hyperbole, that I was an undercover cop. <laughs> at 15, I was already 6'4", 220. I had a full mustache. <laughs> I was, you know, I, I was, I was jacking the weights every day back then too, as well. So I was, you know, I was, I had some muscle to me and I was driving. So to them, every, and I looked different and ev to everybody, they were thinking, well, this doesn't make sense. He's already got a car. The guy looks like he's 78 years old. This is, there's something wrong. They thought I was an undercover cop. The teachers thought I was an undercover cop, the principals and the students too, as well. I had no friends, no play with the ladies whatsoever. Really? You, know, you had the car nothing. though, Dwayne, the car didn't help? The car helped a little bit, but you know, the, the, uh, I, I got, I, I hung out with a few girls. Those were the ones who were just, I, I think they were more interested in the fact that maybe I was an undercover cop. <laughs> <laughs> no. But it was, again, just wild, wild, wild. And from there, we were forced to leave Nashville and wound up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Same thing all over again. Mm. Uh, there was that process of, oh, you an undercover cop. And uh, so, but then once we settled and we got some roots in Bethlehem, uh, things changed. No one is more shocked than me. I thought for sure Dwayne was an undercover cop. I was this close to asking him to an Eagles game. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just Love means. That. People really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just been so. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Yeah, I mean, you laugh about it now, but you look, watch Young Rock in the show. That had to be tough on a young kid to just put some roots down and feel like, okay, I'm getting started at this new school and now we're up and moving to a different town. That must have been a difficult childhood. It was, but you don't know it at that time. You yeah. know, Willie, really, it's just, I was an only child and it's just what I knew. And there was no, um, there, there really was no anchoring in. So we never lived in a house. It was always apartments and and mobile homes. Uh, so there was really no, again, there was really no anchoring in and we would move about every year, year and a half. Mm. But it was just my life at that time and I didn't know any different. So I would adjust um, and, um, and, 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 but now looking back, yes, it was challenging. However, it did force me as a kid to adjust and to be, um, and, and to be flexible and show a little bit of agility on my feet, you know, to try and make new friends. 
And, and on top of all that, by the age of, I would say between the ages of seven and 11, people thought that I was a little girl because I was so, Why? because my, because I had really soft features <laughs> and I had really soft Afro hair. So everywhere I would go, thank you for laughing, really. I appreciate it. I need, I, I need, it still hurts, doesn't laughing. it? <laughs> <laughs> Things have worked out okay for me. I was going to say you did all right. Man, I used to get on the bus and I never forget. I'll tell this story and fan audience will appreciate this. I got on the bus when fifth grade, first, first day of school, I get on the bus. I've never ridden the bus in my life. I'm terrified to get on a bus to begin with. My mom just pushes me on the bus. I'm halfway crying. I sit down next to a kid and within 60 seconds, he goes, can I ask you something? I said, yeah. He goes, are you a boy or a girl? Mm. I went, uh, <laughs> fifth grade. Ooh. That'll say, yeah, that'll, you'll still talk They'll about that They'll say anything. Oh, so man. after he recovered, because I knocked him out, he <laughs> was um... <laughs> It's the tequila talking. <laughs> really. it really Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back. for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's, Let's go. go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. <laughs> What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Star ever. His father really made a name for himself here in Madison Square Garden. So did his grandfather, Rocky Mavia. I'm curious how, Dwayne, after given everything you've said about your life and growing up, the son of a professional wrestler, how once you got through Miami and played football and you tried to play in the CFL and that didn't quite work out and you fly back to Miami, open your wallet, I have seven dollars left. What drove you then, knowing the life that could await you as a wrestler, what drove you to that life to get into the ring? Passion. Hmm. It was passion. Again, I, I, grew, I grew up, I, I loved, I loved pro wrestling. I loved it, Willie. I Me loved too. it. These guys were my heroes, especially at that unique time. In the 80s, in the early 80s, pro wrestling was just such a unique industry because when wrestlers would talk in their interviews, yes, they were over the top and wild and some talked very soft and some talked really loud and some posed and got crazy and some were very serious. Um, what was interesting about that is there was such a deliverable of authenticity because back then, if you could not deliver a great interview, 
you were not going to survive in the world of pro wrestling. Right. So these guys, it was all they could do to try and connect down the lens. And, and then, of course, you know, everything, the match, they would have the match and hopefully the match was great. But I love pro wrestling and I love the interview parts of that. And I love these great characters. So I always had a passion for wrestling. So when I was cut from the CFL um, and I was sent home and I had seven bucks in my pocket and it wasn't all paper either. It was like it was five or one and chain. <laughs> at least, I, at least I rounded up. So I'm, I was optimistic, optimistic in my economics that I, at least I had seven bucks and I felt in my gut, Willie, that I had something to offer in the world of pro wrestling. I didn't know what it was. I, I had no idea. And the fight I got in with my dad was, it was extraordinary. My dad was a pro wrestler and he came up at a different time. And his, his thought was, I, I love you as my son and look around. We're in a little apartment that I can barely pay for. And I've given my life to pro wrestling. Uh, I'm not blaming anyone, but it was my life. And this is what I have. I want more for you. And the reason why we got in a fight, I had just gotten a call from the coach, my coach at the CFL, his name was Wally Buono. He's a legend in the CFL and a mentor of mine. And he just offered me a spot to come back and try out for the team next season. And I said, I appreciate it, coach. Thank you very much. But I'm going to close this chapter of my life. Hung up the phone. My dad, dad said, who was that? And I told him how the call went. And he goes, now, what are you going to do? I said, well, I, I want to try and get in the business. He goes, what business? I said, in wrestling. We had the biggest fight, Willie, mm. the biggest fight. But eventually he agreed to train me. And, um, and the rest was, as they say, through a lot of hard work uh, and a little bit of blood and a lot of sweat, uh, the rest was history. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your favorite okay. character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cut. Cold Cut. My buddy Cal cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Wow. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses, private man delivered. All right, it just needs to. for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Which means, finally, The Rock has come back! 
home. And it wasn't like flip on the switch and you're at WrestleMania. It was car dealerships, right, in the parking lot, county fairs, all that kind of stuff to build to where you ultimately right. arrived. Correct, because in no way was I ready for the big leagues of the WWE. You got to cut your teeth somewhere. Now, as we were talking about earlier, uh, luckily, when I started, when I broke into pro wrestling, it was, it was in 1996. So at that time, there were still a few small wrestling territories. Mm -hmm. And one of the territories that was still around was the what's considered the Memphis territory, the USWA, where every star eventually came through. You starved down there because you were making 40 bucks a match. That was my guarantee was 40 bucks per mm -hmm. match, literally 40 bucks per match. No more than that, just 40, no more, no less. There is where I cut my teeth and I made my bones and I learned how to wrestle and I learned the wrestling industry. Um, and that was in used car dealerships. It was in sometimes in barns, high school gyms, uh, flea markets every week. We would wrestle in a flea market every week, every Monday night. And then every Saturday night was the state fair in Nashville. Wow. Flea market was in Memphis. And I lived at the Waffle House. That was my jam. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Smothered, covered, all of it. Yeah, Mother covered the hash browns, yeah. the whole deal. Uh, five cents, I think, was for the jukebox. And we just sit there. I think it was. I, <laughs> but yeah, I th those were times, though, when I look back, um, so grateful for those times. I didn't have any money back then. Nobody really does when you start out. But uh, but man, what a learning lesson that was. Because today, I'll tell you, you know, whether it's whatever it is that's in my life, those times I keep in the forefront of my mind. I truly do. And they give me perspective that I'll never forget. I don't take any of this for granted because things could have been much different for me. And sometimes I look back on some of those stories and I go, I don't know how they weren't. I don't know how sometimes this happened, you know, truly. I suspect you were going to find a way to get where you are one way or another. But were there ever moments where you were at a county fair or at the flea market where you said, man, I don't know if this, I don't know if this is going to work out. Maybe I should have listened to dad or maybe I should try to do something else. Never, never, honestly. Now, not at that time, because at that time I was doing what I loved. Now, I love playing football. I love playing football. I loved it. I, I had a passion for it. I felt like tick, that football was my ticket. Uh, to buy my parents their first house, for me to buy my first house, buy my mom, you know, we have these dreams, buy my mom her first car and ticket. And football was my ticket. Football was my ticket for my education. We couldn't afford college. So I got a full scholarship at University of Miami, played with great players. Um, but in football, I always knew every time I stepped on the field that I was, that I was always trying to catch up because I didn't have the football experience a lot of the guys had. I only had two years of high school football and when I got to University of Miami, I got injured my freshman year. So again, I was playing catch up and I was behind. So it's everything that you could, you know, and that's a fast moving game and players at especially University of Miami at that time, Ray Lewis, Warren Sapp, Gino Toretta, Heisman Trophy winner, you name it, we had the best team in the country. And so the players, uh, we all pushed each other, but it was, it was a very consistent, I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to play catch up. I'm playing catch up here behind the eight ball and still trying to find the shift and click moment. You know how in life, when we do something, we have, we do something and it's a shift and click and you know, I'm here. This yeah. is what I was born to do. Hmm. When I stepped into a wrestling ring, I never had that. It was, this feels at home. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is what I was born to do. So yes, it was at a county fair. Yes, it was at a flea market in front of 150 people. Uh, half of them going, you suck. That's okay. <laughs> That's wrestling. Somebody's got to be telling you you suck, right? Yeah, that's wrestling. But I never had that moment in wrestling. No. Now, yeah. when I left wrestling and transitioned to Hollywood, uh, there was a time there where I wondered if I had made the right decision mm -hmm. because the movies, they, I was, you know, to use a baseball analogy, maybe they were, I was hitting singles, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a double if I got lucky, but they weren't in, in no way, they weren't, um, commensurate, I think, to the success I thought I was going to have. So certainly not the success I already had in wrestling because I had left wrestling. I quietly walked away from wrestling um, and because I felt like I really needed to commit myself to movies uh, and commit myself to that career. And if I was going to have a shot at film in Hollywood or any kind of career that had longevity in Hollywood, I got to commit to it. 
So when I quietly walked away, there was a time where I felt like, I don't know if this was the right decision. Mm. You know, it's funny, Dwayne, as we sit here toasting all these anniversaries, it was 20 years ago on May the 4th that The Mummy Returns came out, which is the first prominent role you had in a movie. So 20 years since you really did make that transition over. Can you believe from that moment and all those doubts you had about it, where you've ended up now as, by a lot of measures, the biggest star in Hollywood? No, I can't believe it. No, that wasn't, was never my goal. Willie, the goal was not to become the biggest this or the biggest that or most this. It was just to have a career that was good and quality was important to me because also I came from a world that while very successful and, and consistently did good business, what we'll call in the world of pro wrestling, I was looked down upon mm-hmm. when I came to Hollywood and it was because it was wrestling and it's pro wrestling and there's a space for it. And yes, the ratings are pretty good, but it's still wrestling. Yeah. So I had that mark and I thought, okay, well, I'm still proud of where I came from. I'm still proud of the name that I built as a pro wrestler and I love pro wrestling, but I got my work cut out for me. And, and I think in order for me to overcome these doubts, then I want to, I have to have a career that, that had a, had a, had a foundation of quality to it. And um, I remember at that time, <clears throat> someone in my life at that time uh, had said, uh, someone in terms of executive at that time said, are you sure this is the way to go? You, there's no lines in the movie. You have one line and it's not even English. Aku Mashente is the only <laughs> thing I would never forget. It was my one line. And no one really knew what it meant at all. I said, I do. I believe this is the right step and the right, the right transition, the right role. Because I don't know what I'm doing. I, you know, I love this idea of movies, but I've never been on a movie set. So here we go. Let me be a sponge. Let me learn. And let me say Aku Mashente like I know what I'm talking about. And let's see what happens. <laughs> well, you nailed that line because then they gave you another movie out of that. The Scorpion they gave me game. more words to say. <laughs> <laughs> but our guiding light will always be our shared values and love of country. I want to ask you as we sip our tequila here, there's a part of Young Rock, as if you're running for president in 2032. A lot of people are reading a lot of things into that because you have been mentioned before. And the truth is, in our divided country, there aren't that many people we all agree on anymore. And I think you're one of them and Dolly Parton and there are probably, there's a handful of them. So is that something that still interests you, Dwayne? Well, let me take another drink of Terramana before I answer that one. <laughs> it always helps with the answer. Um, I have a goal and an interest and an ambition to unite our country. And I also feel that <clears throat> if this is what the people want, then I will do that. So, and and, and again, I have to contextualize it because a lot of times the comments like this are taken out of uh, context is I always, and this goes back to me wrestling in flea markets and used car dealerships. And even in that, as, as small and as intimate and as rowdy as those crowds were, Willie, I still had my finger on the pulse of the people and I always wanted to send them home happy. And I always got an idea of what they wanted in that moment. So the people telling you they would want that would mean what? That you put it out there and see what people think about it or that there's polling or how will you know if the people are asking you to take that step? I think you would do deep dives of polling and things like that. I think you would really have to um, make sure that I had the right people in place who know that world in terms of politics. And, and then we would get a real sense of we would get a real sense of what the people wanted. So in no way, if I were to ever run for president, would I think, okay, I'm going full bore head, um, pedal to the metal, surround myself with great people and not know if this is what the people want. Um, what the people want will lead and inform that decision. And if it is in fact what they want, um, then I'm gonna take another drink of my Terramana and I'm gonna say, okay, let's do it. <laughs> You can see more of our interviews with your favorite stars every week on Sunday Today. Until then, thank you for watching. Ready to pull the stem out? Watch, you go like this. Just bend it over. That's a funny sound, huh? Nice. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal on Today All Day. 
This week it's Taco Tuesday, and we are showing you our favorite ways to turn any Tuesday into a fiesta with my steak tacos and turkey veggie quesadillas. And of course, any taco night wouldn't be complete without a great salsa. So don't miss a bonus recipe, my zesty mango salad, which can be made mild or spicy, however you like it. All right, so planning meals for an entire week can be so challenging, so stressful. One way to make meal prep easier is to give each night its own theme. I find that when you have a theme, it's easy to program your favorite dishes to kind of match that menu. So our first recipe is for steak tacos. For this steak marinade, you're gonna need garlic, cilantro, jalapeno, orange, lime, vinegar, oil, and salt. And for the homemade salsa to top these tacos with, you'll need tomatoes, onions, garlic, cilantro, jalapeno, olive oil, lime, and salt. So I've got this split up into our different ingredients. This is all going to be for the marinade, and this is all for our pico de gallo and our toppings and everything once we actually make the tacos. So, here we go. Let's get started. So what we're going to do first is make a marinade for our skirt steak. We want it to marinate for about two to eight hours. Any longer than that, the steak's gonna to turn to mush. Oh, I got my hug, I love my hugs. There's a fancy way you can make this with a mortar and pestle. I just like to throw it all in the food processor. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Can I do it off? Sure. Can I show you a trick? I did a great job. All right, throw all that in there. These are awesome garlics. Say Chanel, this is jalapeno business. Hey Chanel, this is jalapeno business. Cool. That's Chanel's favorite joke. Just throw in some cilantro. Mmm. Mmm. Throw this in there. Mmm, yummy, yummy, yummy. Can I? I can't taste it. You want to taste it? Here. I'm tasting the juice. Yep. You can have that one. I'll, I'll do the juices. Can I, um, can I blend it? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the blender. Vinegar? Mm -hmm. Smell that. I think I only have like two tablespoons left. Mm -hmm. Olive oil, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Yeah. Press it again. All right, so we have our marinade and we are going to pour it all over the steak and then just let it sit for the next several hours. Ooh. Let's cover this up and pop it in the fridge, and then we can make our salsa. We just need a couple of big chops, because we're gonna let the food processor do all the work. Do onions make you cry? Yeah. Oh, man. Did you remember your trick? Conventional pink color, but that's because of the food processor. Okay. You gonna clean this mess for me? It does a, a big one. <laughs> We're gonna let this sit and all the flavors come together. We've got the steak marinating and all those flavors are gonna come together. Yeah. And later we'll fire up the grill pan and we'll make our steak tacos, right? Okay. Okay, so we have had the steak marinating all day long, right? It's a little bit closer to dinner time now, right? Are you hungry? It's already dinner time. So we should finish this. Yeah, we have to hurry. Okay. <laughs> I love that sound. <laughs> Can I have pepper? Can I have pepper? Okay, that's why it, I wanted to do it. <laughs> Who said the pepper? Should we make some guacamole? Whoa! 
So you'll notice if you look at the meat, it all goes that way, like all the lines are kind of going that way. So we want to cut this way against the grain so that it's nice and tender. Otherwise, it'll be too hard to chew. All right, should we try it? Um, how I, I can't do it with anything. What do you think? Yummy. Yeah, do you like tacos? I another one. The next recipe on our menu for Taco Tuesday is a veggie and turkey quesadilla. The secret to this recipe is to really just use whatever you have around the house. Just open the fridge, pull out whatever veggies or meat you have on hand. And here's how Cal and I made our easy cheesy quesadillas. Do you love quesadillas? Mm -hmm. Yum, yum, yum. Ready to get started? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do you like quesadillas? Because they, we can have cheese in them. Is it just a means of eating cheese? Um, yeah. <laughs> you did pretty good, that's perfect. Okay, let's cut up some zucchini and we'll try it again. Cut it, I'll give you some strips to cut, okay? Yeah, what's your favorite food? Fried rice. Fried rice? Maybe we'll make fried rice one day, what do you think? While you do that, I'm going to peel the carrot, okay? okay. Who picks mushrooms? Farmers. Oh, for us? Mm-hmm. So you like mushrooms? Ah, uh, of course I do. Ready to pull the stem out? Watch, you go like this. Just. Bend it over. That's a funny sound, huh? Nice. Slicing up nice and thin like this. Guess what time it is? Huh? It's onion time. So I'm gonna do this onion real quick, okay? See you later. Oh, that's a gross onion. What? What's in that gross onion? Look at that. All right, no onion. Can I see Mama? That's not loud. I know, it wasn't that hot. Is that a little salt and pepper? It's turkey. Oh. We're gonna use this instead of beef tonight because we had beef last Did night. Did someone catch a turkey? I think they caught the turkey, yeah. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses by the man who delivered it. All right, it just did too. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Boom. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before.
the latest styles and biggest names. Today Food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it is the answer. What's for dinner? Later. Tacos? Can you say taco? Ollie, can you say taco? Taco. <laughs> and cheese? cheese? Ollie, Ollie, can you say cheese? Cheese. <laughs> Ollie, can you say beef? Beef. <laughs> Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. So you just heard Ollie say it. It's Taco Tuesday. And this week we're showing you our favorite ways to turn any night into a fiesta. Now, of course, this theme night wouldn't be complete without chips and salsa. And sometimes I like to mix it up with something sweet. So I recently taught Calvin how to make my mango salad that doubles as a salsa. I love this recipe because it's really versatile. And for this recipe, you're going to need mango, shallots, red bell pepper, cilantro, and lime juice. Sour. That's sour. not sour, juicy. <laughs> juicy and sweet? You were just teasing? All right, that's enough mango, right? Mm -hmm. So can you help me put all the mango in the bowl? This is all my pile. That's your this, pile? This is your tiny bit pile. I can do this bit pile? Yeah. Okay. Bam, bam. It slip out my hands. <laughs> do you know what this is? No. An onion. It does look like an onion. This is actually called a shallot. Wait, it's gonna hurt my eyes. Okay. It's gonna hurt my eyes? It's not gonna hurt your eyes, okay? What is this? Um, tomato, pepper. A, squeeze it. A pepper? Why do you want to keep squeezing? This is for the lime, silly goose. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is that's a big strip. All right, let's put the red pepper in. What color is missing in here? Green. Green. Cilantro. Cilantro. <laughs> You can help me pick off some of these leaves, okay? Ew! I exposed them my own. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that before? No. I don't think so. Have you ever tasted want. cilantro? No. Pop of color. Pop. I'm sure I'm strong, man. So you can try to squeeze it first on your own. Mm. You squeeze and twist. Squeeze and twist. I do the other line, okay, Mom? I don't know if you need the other line. Let's add a little salt and pepper. Yes, sir! Because the salt brings out the sweetness. And we'll do a little pepper. Brings out the sweetness. <laughs> For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. I dropped the noodles, my bad. Five second rule, but just to be safe, I'm gonna put them in the dishwasher. But I mean, other times, if I was on national television, I'd still go by the five second rule. 
I'm Matthew Smith, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. When I really started cooking was when I was seven years old. That's when I really got into the love of cooking. My family's Vietnamese heritage definitely influences my um, cooking style. My Bao Wai uses some specific ingredients that I still use to this day. I've kind of looked into those ingredients from starting to see things on the internet and starting to kind of be like, oh, lemongrass, for example, is actually used in Vietnamese cooking. And then from there, digging a little deeper, I actually learned, oh, that was the ingredient that my grandma might have had used in one of her recipes. I didn't really have an exact game plan, but I just like kind of loved the experience. I think that the best thing that I learned from participating on the show was not something that I realized immediately, it's actually something that I've come to realize over the years, is that food has so many memories behind it because when I think about it, I don't remember every single dish I made. I don't remember if I finished it in the correct time period. I don't even remember if the judges liked it or not. What I remember are those 23 other kids on the show who were just such a blast and the memories and going out to eat with them and living the life in LA. That's what I remember the most. At the start of this pandemic, um, I had a lot of time off from remote learning, so I decided to cook for 100 days straight. You know, first it was Italy, then it was Asia, then it was a good dessert route. But my dad did remember it as 100 days of cleaning. I'm still 11 years old, so some of my favorite hobbies, I think, are definitely playing the piano. I love playing downstairs ninja, gotta like boom, 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 boom. I think my favorite equipment is probably just the rings because you could just kind of climb on them. And I love reading, you know? So my advice for adults who are not great cooks is try to to see the other joys of it because cooking isn't just about making the food. So just find a part of that that you like to enjoy the process as you go along with it. Welcome to my kitchen. Today I'm going to be making my Bao Wai inspired crispy chicken ramen bowl with soy sauce eggs. I love this dish because it reminds me of Bao Wai because of all the Vietnamese flavors. I'm here at my ramen noodle station. I'm going to be needing 120 grams of bread flour. I'm also going to need um, 60 milliliters of warm water and this is so we can uh, dissolve um, our teaspoon of baked baking soda and finally we're just gonna need a pinch of salt to give a depth of flavor. I'm gonna dissolve my teaspoon of baked baking soda. So now in order to get this all incorporated into our bread flour um, I'm just gonna kind of make a small well here similar to how I would do for uh, pasta. I'm just gonna add in my water mixture. For our depth of flavor, just kind of making our taste buds think a little more, we're gonna be adding in um, our pinch of salt. As you can really see here, our dough is really starting to form. And now I feel like this is all kids' favorite part about cooking, but I'm gonna ditch the fork and I'm gonna get in there with my hands, just kind of starting to add some over since it's very gluey still. We're just kind of starting to add flour and then majestically we're gonna really get a dough out of here. And for kneading, there's really two different ways. I kind of like to use the ball of my hand and start kind of like kneading it this way, but you can also put it back upon itself, which creates more layers and spreads the moisture throughout. I'm gonna take my rolling pin and we're now gonna start rolling this out into a little square. To spread more of that more uh, moisture and all, we're gonna cover it with some saran wrap and rest it for about an hour. If you wanna do it overnight, you can just refrigerate it and take it out in the morning. So now we're gonna be getting started at our chicken station to make our crispy chicken, the star of the show. But um, for this, you're just gonna need two um, skin, um, skin on chicken thighs, as well as some coarse kosher sea salt and some grapeseed oil. So now it's time to score our chicken. Um, this is just by kind of making small cuts within the skin and not the actual poultry. This is gonna ensure that we get a really nice crispy chicken breast. And it will, and will also make sure it crackles up. Now using my other hand, I'm just gonna salt it, making sure to get into all of those uh, cracks as well. 
I have some grapeseed oil, which is perfect for cooking at high temperatures. So I'm now just going to add in our chicken breasts that we made, uh, chicken thighs, my bad. And we're going to put them skin down and let them cook for about seven to 10 minutes. And you want to cook it to an internal temperature of 165 degrees. It says that it is an internal temperature of 166. So I think we did our job, everybody. So now I'm just going to put this out onto a plate. We're going to let that rest over there. So we don't want to get rid of all of that goodness on the bottom of the pot just yet, because that's going to be the base for our broth. I will definitely say while making this, there's a lot of influence from my uh, Bao Wai's cooking this dish more, such as the ginger. It was something she used very often. It's so small and when it's roasted, it just gives that magical and kind of like pop acidic flavor in the back of your throat. So kind of working all throughout the mouth. So now to this pot of chicken goodness, I have uh, my shiitake mushrooms, about a fourth to a half a cup. And to that, I'm going to add in my sliced ginger. To release that ginger flavor, I really find that by cooking it over low heat um, and by slicing it, it really releases the flavor even more. And now we're going to add in the minced ginger since it's we just want it to disintegrate, but we don't want it to burn. You know when this is ready, and I find it's just because you can really smell that ginger coming alive and stuff. That's how I know this is all ready and the mushrooms are a little wilted. I'm gonna add in my chicken stock. So now I'm gonna add in um, my small star anise. I feel like this um, leaves a hint of almost like a pho flavor, which has this very odd um, kind of smell to it, almost majestical if you were to have like a magic castle. But I'm also gonna add in some dried lemongrass. It doesn't have the acidity of fresh lemongrass, but it does give a really nice lemon flavor. So now we're gonna bring this mixture up to a boil and then we're gonna simmer it for 10 minutes to really let the flavors meld together before adding on almost another layer of seasonings. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, yes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? 
there is some late breaking news for us. The Iowa caucuses by the name of the All right, it just fit In order to accomplish these uh, soy sauce eggs, you're gonna need some eggs, sesame oil, some marin, as well as um, a good amount of soy sauce. The first thing you want to do is bring your salted water to a boil. We're gonna immediately add our eggs, and then you're gonna cook this for six and a half minutes. So now that my eggs are done cooking, I'm gonna put them in an ice bath. I'm gonna get started making the marinade. I'm gonna add in my two tablespoons of soy sauce. And then again, for that little bit of uh, stickiness slash sweetness, we're gonna add in our marin, about, two, uh, about a tablespoon or so, and then a bowl turn or a tablespoon of toasted sesame oil. It's time to peel um, our soft boiled eggs. Now we're gonna let our little babies rest. So now we are at our noodle station and we're here to continue preparing our dough. So um, I'm gonna get started rolling it by hand. Um, this is a lot more fun, um, but can also get a little messy too. And I'm just gonna put that on a well floured surface using some bread flour as well. We're gonna go once, go twice, and then we're gonna start making cuts throughout. One, and then we're gonna take it apart and you got a noodle. For the thickness, there's not like an exact thickness, but not as big as you would cut fettuccine, which is a little wider, but not as small as spaghetti. It, a lot of it's also trial and error, if I'm honest with you. But that's my favorite part about being a home cook. We're gonna cook these for four to five minutes so we get those tender springy noodles or otherwise known as al dante. Now that our noodles are cooking, we are getting started um, to finish our broth. So now we're gonna add in that second layer of flavor. So to kind of help that lemongrass out a bit, we have two teaspoons of lemon juice, a little bit of soy sauce. I'm gonna add in some marin, a Japanese wine. Um, also some rice wine vinegar, and then a pinch of salt for again that depth of flavor. Some black pepper for a little bit of bitterness. That's all ready, and let's go check on our noodles. Those are nice and tender, so I'm just gonna scoop some out into a bowl. It's time to go head over to our broth station. So now we're gonna bring our noodles over and we're gonna add some of our delicious broth. This reminds me of my bao wai or my grandma's pho. Like I said earlier, although I love just when I'm with the food, I also love when I'm with my bao wai or my grandma's. Hello, bao wai. I'm so excited to garnish one of my favorite dishes, but also be with my favorite person. Um, bao wai, I just wanna kinda cut it around the bone, um, and so I'm gonna probably cut it into three pieces. We got our scallions now, Bawai. I'm now also gonna add in my soy sauce eggs. And now we're just gonna cut it, Bawai, too. And wow, look at that runny egg yolk, Bawai. Isn't that just so satisfying? Now, Bawai, um, we're gonna get started placing our chicken. And I'll add in both of my eggs, topping it with some black sesame seeds for a little pop. We're just gonna garnish with these um, spring onions. All right, Bawai, here's the final product. And here it is. How do you think it looks, Bawai? Good? Nice. Mm, so good. Bawai, do you like this dish? Yes, I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. But, eh, thank you. Well, I mean, thank you for teaching, like, just kind of being the inspiration to discovering my Asian heritage and making me so proud of that. So now we're gonna continue digging in. I hope you guys enjoyed this recipe as much as I did and thank you again for joining me.
I have been waiting for this interview patiently because um, I have always felt weirdly connected to you in so many different ways because I feel like our lives have these weird parallel paths. And the more I learn about you, the more I feel it. And I just want to say I'm just I've missed oh, you for so that. for a long time. I'm just happy to sit with you. But how are you? You're in Nashville. What's happening? OK, I'm good. Um, I'm in Nashville. We are doing a little bit of touring, mm -hmm. mostly on the weekends. Um, boys are 11 and 14. No, they're not. I am no, they're not. seriously not a cool mom anymore. I'm like, you just don't know, mom. You just don't. You don't know, mom. You don't get it. You don't get it. Can I remind you of something? You were here at the Today Show downstairs in the dressing room with your boys when they were little. And yeah. I went down there and I remembered thinking, watching you with your kids, I want something like that one day. Yes. And I'm telling you, uh, I have more friends. I'm just like, you can do this. Babies are coming in and they you don't get the wrong kids. It just doesn't happen that way. Mm. And my kids so clearly not only picked me, but picked each other. Mm. And man, what a cool honor. You know, I tell my kids all the time, I am so honored to be your mom. You know, I mean, I even told my 14 year old that last night because he hugged my parents as they were leaving oh. just involuntarily. My dad's 89 and my mom's 84. Mm. And I said, after they left, I said, I, I love you so much, but I just want to tell you what a cool person you are. Because oh. not everybody just wants to volunteer a hug. You know, whether it's your grandparents, you know, an elderly, you're a teenager. He just got up and hugged him. And I was just like, man, that you're, you're an awesome boy with a giant it, heart. And he's like, I know, Mom. I know, Mom. Wasn't it your like, mom, know, Cheryl, at the beginning? Because, I mean... I, I remembered thinking, like, I never spoke out loud the fact that I wanted children because I thought mm -hmm. I had missed my window. So I thought, yes. I hate to say something out loud that I know can't happen. So I didn't speak it. And one day I was walking with a girlfriend down a street and she said, well, me and you, we didn't want to have kids, you know, so it worked out great. And I said, well, I actually did. And I just yeah. thought I missed it. And I, I just remember saying it out loud and how weird that was to speak yeah. it and then to yeah. say it again. And it kind of like made it, it made it real. Sometimes I feel like even if you whisper your secret into the mirror, the bathroom mirror, at least yes. it gives it breath and life. Yeah. Did you always want kids? Did you did you talk about it when you were younger? Did you always think about it? I just never, I just never didn't think I would have kids. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I I was thinking of it in the context of family. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like it wasn't like I saw myself being pregnant. I couldn't mm -hmm. wait to experience having a baby inside of me. It wasn't so much that. It was much more about the wonder of getting to raise a person, you mm. know. Um and from a I mean, obviously, as you know, Hoda, mm. I was forty five when I adopted my first one. I was forty eight when I adopted my second one. I I had the gift of getting a lot of things out of my system before mm. I had my kids or before I got my kids. So there wasn't anything that I felt like I was missing. Mm. If I stayed home and something was going on, I just didn't feel like I was missing anything, that I wanted to be anywhere else. And that's that's a gift. I think if I was in my 20s and even early 30s trying to be in the world that I've mm -hmm. lived in for the last 28 years, I might have been pulled in a lot of different directions. But, you know, there's one there's one thing about a woman and the biological clock. You know, we get blamed a lot for the demises of relationships. Well, her biological clock or mm -hmm. uh, she wanted kids and I wasn't ready for that. And it's such a, I don't want to say a sexist thing, but it does feel like that, mm -hmm. you know. And I remember my last relationship crumbling largely because that is what I wanted. I didn't want to be somebody's girlfriend and raise their their kids. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be a stepmom and not be made a wife and a mom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's sort of like being in a relationship with someone, but being also the babysitter, but not being getting to be the real parent. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that did crumble that relationship. And when I came out of it, it was my mom. And I came out of it and also had breast cancer and went through that. And it was my mom who said, why don't you just get a surrogate and get some sperm 
And I mean, this is like yeah. Bernice Crow yeah. from Tiny Town in Missouri. I, my head is like exploding. Like, what did she just say? Like, just have my own babies? <laughs> what? But it was that. It was her saying, look, you know what? If you adopt, we you have a family around you who yes. will stand at the altar with you at baptism and say, we are his mm. community or her community. Mm. And that's what they did. And that's kind of what gave me the you know, the life raft to not limit myself to that. Oh, you got to be married. Mm-hmm. You got to be stable. Uh, then you have kids. My story didn't lay out like that, but the story I was telling myself limited what I thought I could have until mm. somebody stepped in and said, wait a minute, your story doesn't have to look like your mom and dad's story. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to look like the conventional family that you had. Fam- families look like all different things. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made two. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back. You know what's interesting? You just you said something in the in the middle of that story that struck me too because um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the same time um, my relationship was falling apart. And what was weird about that moment when you just mentioned it, I had this weird feeling. Mm-hmm. But what I remember about it was it was kind of strange because I felt like I had two pains going on at the same time and I couldn't go down the rabbit hole on one. Like I was so angry at him and then I had to go in for my test and they were like, you need a mastectomy. And then I was so mad at the doctors and why me? And I ate apples and ran in Central Park and what are you talking about? I was so mad. And then and then I was thinking about, but what about, oh, and him, you know, but it was almost like, and I kind of liken it to like having two kids and one kid's coloring on the wall and the other kid's spilling flour all over the floor. And you can't, like you, you only have so much attention. So you can't get super yes. mad at that kid because you got this kid over here So you're just, so you're, weirdly, your grief is kind of lessened. And I wondered in a weird way if that, I've often wondered, did that help me in some strange way? I couldn't, I couldn't get so depressed on one thing because I had two things to worry about. Yes. I, you know, uh, well, I mean, not to analyze my Mm -hmm. last relationship and it was a public relationship. There were a lot of facets to it, Mm -hmm. but it was a relationship that, um, that I seem to keep going back to. And I think when I got diagnosed with breast cancer, that was like, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I think we have to really look at this and you have to put yourself first. And once I got that message, I really had to sit down and learn how to hold an emotion. Um, I remember my friend who I used to say was kind of psychic, but he said, no, everybody's (laughs) intuitive. It's just whether Mm. you really want to know the truth. He had said to me, he's like, you know, uh, uh, awaken, uh, emotions are the gateway to awakening. And I had not really understood that until I had to go through a real grieving process. I had to not do that thing that we got, we get so good at, which is, oh, just don't think about it. Just yeah. stay busy. Just stay make yourself busy. busy. Don't busy. dwell in it. Yeah. Just, and that is the antithesis of what we need to do for healing. Um, you know, we need to actually sit with the pain, the anger, the grief, um, all of it that goes along with 
getting to the other side. Um, and you know, the only way to get through it, plow through it and experience it. And so for me, I just embraced it. I said, I'm not going to make a record. I'm not going to pick up my guitar. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to journal. I'm actually going to sit and be wow. angry and be sad and be, and grieve and all that. And when I came out of it, I just felt like, oh, okay, I remember now who I am. <laughs> and all these events, I think kind of help us remember who we are. We get so far away from it sometimes with all the messaging that we put on ourselves about who we mm -hmm. are or we aren't. And um, it was, man, it was a real, it was a serious cleanup. Wow. I didn't realize. Clean no up on aisle seven. <laughs> no. Well, I love like no records and no journaling. That's interesting just to sit in the middle of it. Did you ever, I never, and this is probably not healthy. This is me. I, I never really had a follow-up conversation after it was over. That was the end. Um, and that's how yeah. I played it. Well, I mean, I think in some situations, um, I mean, man, I'll tell you what, I, I am blessed to have a wise mom, but she mm -hmm. said, no matter what you think you're going to get from that conversation, you're never going to get what you think. Mm. And I mean, that's just, that's part of, I guess, the end of a relationship. There's not generally closure. Mm -hmm unless you both are, I mean, that if, if you communicated that way, you might not have split. But in mm -hmm. my relationship, I was not ever going to get the kind of answer I thought I was going to yeah, get. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if you're like this, Hoda, but I have measured myself for almost my whole life by my productivity. Mm -hmm. And that's what gave me self-worth. Mm -hmm. And not just not just the quantity, but the quality, you mm -hmm. know, it couldn't be, it couldn't be 10 songs. It had to be 10 great songs mm -hmm. and they couldn't be t 10 top 200 songs. They had to be 10 top 10 songs. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, it's exhausting. At, at a certain point you, yeah. it's exhausting and you wind up never feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes in order to fill yourself, you have to like sit with it. Sit with it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause I know it's like when you put a song out, they're like, well, when's the next one? You put an album out. When's the next one? You write a book. When's the next one? You're like, oh my yeah. God, how about this one? How about if we sit with yeah. this one for one can second? We just, can we just look at this baby <laughs> right here? <laughs> look at this cute chubby baby. Oh. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's good. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. I was just thinking back to your the the infancy of your career, and I know that people look at you and think, you know, they see you, um, first of all, just, I, I watched you, I think, at Radio City. That was one of my final concerts before the world shut down, and I loved every second of it. But I was just thinking about people probably think, well, that was, somehow it was easy for her. But I loved knowing that, and I think it was 1986, you were 
pounding the pavement and they were like, no, darling, no, no, not yeah. you. Nothing. Oh, no yeah. doors were opening. And you were as you were talented. So what was happening there? Well, you know, I look back on it and I think, man, I was so lucky to come up when I did and not come up now because yeah. now everything is so brand oriented and so mm-hmm. all about self-promotion. But back in the old days, back in the dark ages, <laughs> um, I moved from St. Louis where I was a school teacher and I thought, well, I was 25 or so, uh, well, no, I was 24 mm-hmm. and I had a bunch of tapes and I thought, I'm just going to go out to LA and see what happens. And I got a Thomas guide and I found out where all the studios were and I took my tapes to every studio. And if I get them to the studios and somebody will pick it up and listen to it and discover me, you know, and it, it was literally like an episode of Friends and, you know, slowly I wound up getting a little bit of work and then I overheard some backup singers talking about the Michael Jackson audition. Then I crashed the Michael Jackson audition audition. And I mean, it just crashed the Michael funny. Jackson audition. Just, yes. just even to say that out loud. It's crazy. Yeah. And I think part of my, what was in my favor was my naivete. I mm-hmm. mean, I just didn't ever think, um, I just thought, well, if, what's the worst thing that can happen? Sorry, you can't come in. You weren't recommended. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it just, It's hard to explain, but all all I would say is that what seemed like an overnight success, my first album didn't even come out until I was almost 30. Oh, really? So, yes. And 30, by all intents and purposes, in the rock and roll world, I mean, I'm old enough to be, at 30, (laughs) probably Olivia Rodrigo's mom, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I can remember uh, meeting Taylor Swift on an airplane mm-hmm. and she was literally a teenager and I was like old enough to be her mom. <laughs> um, so yeah. And I've been really lucky. I mm-hmm. I've had now, mm-hmm. um, God, I hate to even say, say it, it. But I'm getting returned 60. So, um, let's just I'll sit. be 60 in February. Let's sit with that. I've girl. had 30 amazing years. You know, I've had incredible, uh, an incredible journey. And mm-hmm. I don't know that You can even have that kind of career anymore because the attention span is so shrunk Mm -hmm. and everything is so fast and all about social media and here today and gone Mm -hmm. tomorrow. I'm just, I feel lucky that I had those pound the pavement years where nobody would give me a record deal because I was a a blue eyed soul singer is what Uh they called it. Uh Back in the day when Madonna, I mean, it was all about Madonna and Paula Abdul and People are like, I, we don't know what to do with you. Yeah. Who are you? So, so wait, who, you, yeah. you, you said the word 60. Um, how did that, how, I how did that feel coming off your tongue? How does, how do you, how do you sit with, with 60? How does that feel? You know, those little bumps you get on the side of your tongue that are like a little canker sore or whatever. That's what it feels like. <laughs> oh, um, no, I mean, yeah, I don't love it, but um <laughs> You know, I, I have to say, I'm I'm really at this point in my life. I'm I am happy. Um, I something really changed after the cancer episode yeah. and getting my kids. And uh, you know, if I if I never got to sing another song, I would still feel the joy that I feel right mm. now. And that's a good place to be. You know, for mm. somebody who's always measured themselves by shucking and jiving Mm -hmm. through you know life like look at me i can twirl i can Mm -hmm. sing Mm -hmm. i can play the bass and the piano Mm -hmm. you know and to be able to say you know what i love my life Mm. um it's a great place to be now what what has motherhood given you that um your work couldn't that relationships couldn't well i mean I, uh, well, motherhood has changed. It's 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 created a um, a barometer for sure. I mean, I don't make any decisions that aren't pretty well decided by virtue of what my kids have going mm-hmm. on. So, although that I'm sure irritates everyone around me, I I don't plan anything without. Like I've already been told by my 11 year old, he doesn't want to go on the tour this summer. Oh. He wants to stay home and play baseball and you oh. know, hang out with his friends. So now so, what do we do? Well, we're going to – and we got invited to play in Europe the first week of school. Ooh. I don't want to do that. Okay. So you're not so, doing – So, I mean, we're going to – we've been we've been learning the lesson of, first of all, compromise and secondly, mm-hmm. uh, uh, f- friendly uh, – 
friendly. <laughs> what what is it? Not uh, tyranny, but um, <laughs> when you're the ruler of a of a country, this is what happens when uh, you're six. You can't think what? of words. <laughs> uh, friendly dictatorship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if it doesn't work in the compromise, then there's the friendly dictatorship. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I I would say that I had to really, before I could be happy being a mom, I had to be happy. And hmm. that was the first thing. And then mm -hmm. being a mom has been the greatest, the greatest gift and the greatest occupation. I mean, I I have full respect for moms mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. Single moms, working moms, even married moms. Mm -hmm. Being a mom is no joke. Mm -hmm. It's 24 hours a day. And unless you're gonna let somebody else raise them, you are on call 24 hours a day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Do you have room for uh, another love in your life, do you think? I do. Um... Do you already have that? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I um, I mean, I don't want to say sadly. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, our family is, is, I mean, we, we're complete. My, 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 um, it's tricky now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just. Yeah, tricky. sure. You date somebody mm -hmm. and you, and you pretty quickly decide how they might fit mm -hmm. or if they unequivocally you wouldn't even let them near your kids. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and truth be told, mm -hmm. I just don't feel like I'm missing it anymore. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the idea of it and mm -hmm. I would love to be loved and to love, but my first loves are my boys mm -hmm. and whatever I bring in or whatever comes in, I just, I'm open. I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. I'm open. You're open. Um, yeah. When it came down to, you know, I my my girls were adopted too. They're four and two, and um, I've they know they're adopted. I've, obviously, I've told yes. them, and yeah. I know more questions are coming as we go. And yeah. I I guess I'm looking for a little advice because I don't really quite know. Like first, I thought should I volunteer information? I thought now let me wait till they ask me. <laughs> I, I, that's, there's such tricky conversations to have. How did you yeah. know how to navigate those waters? Well, I had two different situations with mm -hmm. my boys. I knew Wyatt's birth mom mm -hmm. and I did not know Levi's mm -hmm. birth parents. Um, but what I did with Wyatt was I made his story. I made a book, the story mm -hmm. of Wyatt and I had pictures of the day he was born. My mm -hmm. mom and dad were there and I got to take him home. He was four hours mm -hmm. old. And mm -hmm. so I had all these pictures and it explained who everybody was. And it talked about how, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd ask God to be a mom mm -hmm. and that I knew that God was going to take care of me and that if I was supposed to be a mom, I would be. And that lo and behold, God brought this, brought you into my life. And, um, but that 
he came through somebody else's tummy, but I got to be his forever mom, you know. Oh. Um, <laughs> so anyway, he, from a very early age, not only was not interested in it, didn't want to see it at all. Oh, okay. Um, and, and even really up until the age that he was able to understand it, well, actually, hmm. period, um, mm -hmm. he's not wanted to see that book. He hasn't mm. been ready. He, okay. he chose his life, and he didn't want to know about the rest of it. Mm -hmm. My uh, Levi is very, I mean, he's very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. There is nothing he will not say or ask. <laughs> Um, if you want to know if you look fat in a pair of jeans, he will tell you. <laughs> um, and he's right off the cuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Were my birth parents short? Because I really want to play basketball. <laughs> I mean, th these are the things that matter to him, you know. Um, he asks questions, um, mm -hmm. and he has the story of Levi as well. Mm -hmm. And he likes it. He doesn't want to look at it. But he's more – he's going to be my – He's going to be my, I'm going to go out and find him on my own. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I've told both my boys, when you are ready, mm -hmm. you know, after when you become old enough, like 18, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. We'll go find him together. Mm -hmm. And nothing will come between the way you and I love each other. Mm -hmm. But you have a lot of love. Mm -hmm. So, and you love people in a lot of different ways. And families look differently. Um, no, but neither one of them have asked me why their birth moms gave them away. Mm -hmm. And some of those questions will be hard. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but I do have that fear of, okay, someday when I'm older, they go find their younger mm -hmm. mom mm -hmm. and suddenly I'm going to spend Christmas at mm -hmm. my mom and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or with my real brother. Mm -hmm. And I, I get emotional about it and I get yeah. scared, but you know what? It's, it's like I, uh, it's like I tell my my dad when he's worrying. Hmm. There's no point in worrying about it. It's not going to fix it. Yeah, you know when you when you get there, you get there. So that's just the way I'm approaching it. I think yeah, that sounds healthy, and I like this the sort of God's got this. It's sort of like you know because I I you know I have those feelings too, and I they don't they don't ask many questions now. They're they're super right. young, but they do know. A lot of things so yeah I just yeah. I I literally some days I get this ouch in my in my stomach I'm like okay yeah I gotta be ready like yeah. how's this how's this gonna how's this gonna go what do they think when you're on stage are they wigged that you're up there killing it or do they think it's At early days they didn't really understand it like mm -hmm. I've got videos of both the boys coming out in their PJs <laughs> um, I had this had this wonderful nanny who's now my assistant um, and they would always come say goodnight before they'd go to bed like mm. at 8 30 you know mm -hmm. and I'd just be getting started and mm -hmm. um, and they'd come out and sometimes they'd come out on stage in their PJs <laughs> and do a little jig or whatever <laughs> and they just seeing all those people that's you know they they didn't really understand what that meant and then mm. when I when I started making this last the record before the last called be, be myself and I was making it during school hours. I would go pick them up and I'd bring them back to the studio and we'd work for another couple hours. Mm -hmm. They got to be around during the making of that record and understand, oh, this isn't just something where she goes out on stage and mm -hmm. sings songs. She works. Like it's a workplace mm -hmm. and it's like serious work hours and mm -hmm. doing things over and over. And then they, they got interested in it and got to like learn about some of the engineering stuff. And then it became like, oh, Okay, so she's not just famous because she has like mm -hmm. all I want to do, or mm -hmm. <laughs> right. soak up the sun, yeah. or the song from Cars, <laughs> and that made a difference. But you know, now that they're older, you know, they'll come to the side of the stage and wave, and then they'll go back and want to mm -hmm. get on their iPads, and mm -hmm. I'm just like, ah, ah, no, no, oh, no. My. <laughs> so they 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 make money by helping out. Um, oh, is that they, how they do? They make five dollars a gig for bringing out guitars. And la two summers ago, when we were out with Phil Collins in Europe, yeah. about halfway through the gig, Levi's like, "We're walking off stage," and Levi's like, "Mom, can we negotiate a flat rate? Five dollars a gig doesn't seem like very much." I'm like, "Are you kidding me? You're nine years old. <laughs> how do you know what a flat rate is? How do you even get that? Wait, are they musical? Do they are are any, either of them yes, music? They, they are. are. They are musical, but." Mm -hmm. um, uh, that you know, they. I think part of it is they came in that way, but also they've been saturated and yeah. by osmosis they yeah 
they are musical. Uh, Cheryl, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. Hoda, for I love you. I love you too. Come see let's me. Let's get when our you... kids to marry each other. Oh my God, that Come would be on, perfect. Let's do it. Yes, it's not that big of an age gap. Eight no. years and ten years. Yes. I mean, come I mean on. by the time they're adults, <laughs> yeah, you know. Okay. We'll have a date. All right, honey. Good okay. seeing you. All right. It's good Take to care. see you, too. You, too. Thanks. Hi, Jenna. Hi. I don't know why I'm thinking this in this moment, but I was just thinking when you first, very first, had your very first day at work at the Today Show, mm -hmm. I don't picture you being intimidated, but I wonder if when you walked in on day one, if you were. I mean, yes, I think. And I think I was well aware that I was coming from teaching, that it was a total shift and what yeah. I'd been doing. I think the other thing that was hard is that the very first time I sat down on the couch, they were announcing like, oh, you're joining the show and let's talk about you. And for some reason, I know this may sound weird yeah. now, but that made me uncomfortable. Talking about Talking about myself. Yourself. Like telling the stories. I was so excited because then we were flying to Dallas and I was uh -huh. going um, to tell the story of this little boy that I'd met there that I just loved. Mm -hmm. And that part felt natural to mm -hmm. me, the storytelling about somebody else. But when they were talking about me, I just remember like blushing and feeling kind of embarrassed. I, I kind of I remember the uh, initial days and everybody's look, NBC is a great place mm -hmm. to work and everyone's mm -hmm. really nice. Mm -hmm. But whenever you go into a new place and the people have been there for years and years and years and you're learning the skills, like I know that you're a worker, but I didn't realize how hard you worked until you came to yeah. NBC. I mean, you did not stop. You were like, I am going to work. I'm going to work until I learn all this stuff. Yeah. And I mean, a therapist might say too much <laughs> <laughs> because I think you know, coming into a new place, I'm also aware of what people might think about me. You know, I have a public life. I had had a public life really by no, not my choice, mm -hmm. but I was born into one. And so I, you know, I'm not naive. I knew that people might think, oh, you know, she doesn't need to work. You know, she's or she, why does she work hard? And so I think I, tried to prove otherwise and maybe people didn't even think that mm -hmm. you know I have Do no you, I, I no idea but I worked against that so I, I don't think I've ever been anywhere with you where someone hasn't said oh my gosh I knew your grandfather I knew I, I you know I worked with your dad and I wonder you always have you know a beautiful smile and you're always wanting to hear how what oh yeah I'll tell them but I wondered like how does that feel yeah I mean, I don't think it's always been that way. Yeah. And it's so funny because Poppy actually just said something to me. She said, Daddy told me that you used to not like that people knew who you were. And now that you're okay with it. And I was like, that's probably true. I was also like, why are they talking about me? <laughs> but that's probably true. I think in college in particular, you yeah. know, Barbara and I, want, we were normal kids. Like we had a very normal childhood. We grew up in Midland, Texas, moved to Dallas. Mm -hmm. You know, we our grand. it was interesting because we had grandparents who had big jobs, but they weren't in our day to day. Mm -hmm. So it was foreign to us, which is weird. And I know that that's probably hard for people to believe, but it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so much so that when my dad became president, he was like, don't worry, you can be normal. Like he just he wanted said? to give us what oh, we wanted, God. but like obviously we couldn't. But he, I think he really believed that. How did they do that? Like what did they do to make life normal? Like how I mean, did they I do think it? they, you know, they just never asked us to go on one. We didn't do one campaign or political event for our dad until we graduated from college. Oh, wow. I mean, when we were little, we might have done a thing or two for yeah. my grandfather. But once my dad ran for president, we didn't go to one mm. thing. I mean, election night, you know, but but during the campaign trail, we didn't want to be part of it. And he that was OK with him. Like he wasn't using us as his daughters for any sort of, you know, campaign mm -hmm. picture or anything like that. We just weren't part of it. And um, and I think. You know, I think they allowed us to have our lives. I think one thing that was really fortunate for Barbara and me is that college is this really selfish time. Yeah. Meaning you're trying to figure out who you are outside of your family, outside of what the expectations mm -hmm. your household has for mm -hmm. you. And so we could be in that. 
you know, we could like explore. And so we didn't really think a lot about all that came with our mm-hmm. dad's job. You know, we could try to come up with our own identity. And so I think then it was hard. Um, I mean, it was particularly hard for Barbara, who went to Yale, didn't know anybody. And she says even now, she's like, I don't think anybody <laughs> voted for dad. And even her <laughs> college roommates were in the front row of like some book event. I'm like, no, surely y'all voted for him. And they were like, no, no we did not. <laughs> so I think it was particularly hard for her. I mean, I went to a school where yeah. I was surrounded by friends I already had. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think we, that type of thing embarrassed us. Yeah. I'm just thinking about how cool it would be to have a twin sister to go through yes. life with. You know exactly what the other's feeling. She just had a baby. I know. She's been waiting for that I for know. so long. I mean, it is, it's because we've done everything together and particularly when we were little you know, we were in sync. One of us Mm -hmm. wasn't older and therefore cooler and had a different reaction to Mm -hmm. something that was happening. We were, we had a really shared history Mm -hmm. because we were the same age. Um, And so it's interesting how adulthood happens and how I just met Henry and like was a child bride and had kids, (laughs) you know, and, and that she didn't meet somebody, you know, she had a lot of boyfriends, but wasn't, and, and people always asked about it. I mean, it was kind of, disheartening you know to travel with her and people would say like well why aren't you married painful oh god i mean painful is the right word and um you know actually condoleezza rice once said that people asked her too Mm. why she's not married Mm. even now after she was secretary of state you know after she's done all these things like when you want to ask her about like the nuclear code or something like why are you asking that question and um and so and and i think you know one of the things that people assume too is like you know why had hadn't she had kids and um she actually had decided before my grandmother died she had a conversation with my grandmother where she had decided to have kids on her own she did and she She talked talked to to my grandmother grandmother about about it and my grandmother said i think that's a really good idea and so barbara froze her eggs and Mm. was planning if she didn't meet somebody to go ahead and do it, you know, and then hopefully meet somebody mm-hmm. else or, you know, I, I don't, that was her plan. And, and she was so, um, I think she was so comforted by our grandmother's response, mm-hmm. which was encouraging. Mm. You know, she was so encouraged mm-hmm. by our 92 year old grandmother's, cool that? yeah, that she thought, you know, that sounds like a good idea. Do you miss her, your sister? Yeah. I do. I mean, she's going to be moving back here. Oh, she is. Okay. So I'll be spending more time with her, but I do. I and I say. and it is it's interesting how our lives followed this very similar narrative as little kids and then took this, you know, I just started a family earlier. It'll be really fun to watch her become a mom and she's FaceTiming me with the baby, oh, you know, feeding the baby a bottle and all of those like wondering what we should do for Halloween, like all of these mm. things that where our narratives are coming back together. And I just can't wait to watch her, you know, become a mom. I know there's so many, when you think of all these phases of life where Mm -hmm. you think I couldn't breathe without the person next to me. Yeah. And suddenly they're not next to you. Yeah. And make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. (laughs) 
Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Back. I'm so happy. Yeah. I didn't know she was yeah. moving back. Yeah, she's moving back here, which I think will be really oh, great. God. Yeah. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> You're about to turn 40. Mm -hmm. um, how does that sit with you? How does 40 sit? It's interesting. It feels, um, I mean, in some ways, I'm not, I haven't even really thought about it. Yeah. But one of the things that's interesting is that my dad had a big milestone at 40. He quit drinking the day after his 40th birthday. Wow. And I actually don't remember him ever drinking. Like, I, I was five years old, so my first memories didn't, I, I had no memory of him ever drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to me because a lot of his stories, you know, to us, just in our family, sort of begin at 40. Hmm. His life re, I think he had like a, a new lease on life at 40, a really important revelation that he just couldn't, you know, drink. And um, so that's something, I mean, that sits with me. That mm -hmm. that sits with me because it was just a, a really important part of our family. Like that choice that he made really had ramifications that, you know, felt all the way down to us. And so that's an interesting thing. Does he, is that something that um, he talks about? Yeah. He does. Well. I mean, he does. He does. He didn't, you know, he really just woke up on the day after his 40th birthday. I'm like, Henry, you better watch me on my 40th birthday because <laughs> I don't really want to quit. You know, I don't think I need to. But he woke up and just decided that it didn't you that know, was suit enough. him, that he wasn't as, as um, present of a parent mm -hmm. um, or a, a husband as he wanted to be. And so, yeah, he talked talks about it. I mean, he talks about just how, and I think it's something that's super important mm -hmm. that I, in my life to just take stock of the choices that I'm making, you know, and make sure that, and it's something that I'm, I think about, um, you know, he's, he had a conversation with me when I was younger and just said, you know, you always, it runs in our family, alcoholism. Yeah. And so think about it, you know, just make sure that you're you're making those choices that are best for your family, and so I do think about that because I think there is this culture and uh, and with motherhood in particular where it's like, you know, mm -hmm. celebrates right, mommy juice. Let's mommy go to the juice. park. We'll meet together. Yeah, or it's this a lot is of fun. mommy drinks this. Yeah, ha, ha, ha. and I think because I had a father who was, you know, vocal about mm -hmm. about that choice, um, that it. It makes me just think about it in my own life, too. I was going to ask you if anything scares you. Um, it, and I wondered if that was on the list. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does. And we have, I, you know, other friends, people you know whose mm -hmm. parents have been, were alcoholics. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think it. I, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp mm -hmm. on – you know, it, I don't feel like it affects me in a way, but my sisters quit drinking. Mm -hmm. um, my mom no longer drinks. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it definitely is something that, it, you know, I don't think it's as scary because I don't remember that part. Yeah. My dad dr drinking too yeah. much. And, and I never really thought, you know, my mom, I don't remember my mom drinking mm -hmm. too much. So it's not like, but I think I'm definitely aware of it. Yeah. Um, does anything intimidate you? Like if someone were to walk, in, is, there, is there a person who could walk in the room right now who would intimidate you in one way or the other in terms of like, oh my God, I can't believe that person's here. I feel like we've, we've met a lot of cool people. I know, and I'm you, trying to think. I mean, I think, you know, it's funny because when I was first interviewed yeah. for a book that I wrote, Diane Sawyer asked me like who I'd be starstruck by. And I think she expected me to say like Justin Bieber or something, oh, yeah. but he wasn't big then. I mean, yeah. I don't know who would have been like Somebody the 2006 like yeah, Justin Bieber, yeah. but Justin Timberlake, whoever it was. And I was like Toni Morrison. You, to um, you said that yeah, when you were that. Yes, and I because I loved Toni Morrison. And she actually said after the interview, she said, what are you doing now? And I was flying back to Washington, D.C., and she said, because I wanted to invite you to my house and have Tony Morrison come over. And I was like, damn. Wait, first of all, I'm so, I cannot believe that's who yeah. you said. And she was shocked. And she and Diane Sawyer is friends with Tony or okay, you know, was wanna... friends with Tony Morrison. 
So if you loved, you've loved, I know you love books because mm-hmm. you talk about it. Have you loved them forever? I mean, yes. Oh, my God. And Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye I read, yeah. I think, my sophomore year in, in uh, high school. And it totally changed my perspective on everything. And I don't even, it's hard to even articulate why. Mm-hmm. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it is the Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove, because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Jenna, one of the things I love about this podcast and I love since we started is I really do feel like I'm sitting in a therapy session. I'm meeting people and I feel like I almost feel guilty that this is a job. I'm like, oh, my God, thank you. You know, you pay a therapist. I'm like, so how much? But I remember when Pastor Michael Todd Mm -hmm. came on, he had such a profound effect on me. There was Mm -hmm. something about how he viewed the world with intention, how Mm -hmm. every day he set off, he set off with something in mind to do, not just, oh, well, it's another Wednesday. But one of the things that struck me the most was what he said about his relationship with his wife and how he builds on it. He said that we, we become different people mm-hmm. each every five years. So this is what he had to say. If you're married more than five years, you're not married to the same person you married. Like, and we got a, a revelation that you keep changing every five years and I needed to relearn who she was, what she used to like, she didn't like anymore. And so I would do certain things and I was like, man, that used to really work. Like that used to really get you going. Like what, what happened? I mean, that right there, is that the plainest statement? Like you've been with Henry for a long time. It's the plainest, but when you told it to me, yeah, it was like a light bulb yep. went off because I have said to Henry, but like, why aren't you as joyous? Yeah. When I first met Henry, I remember him like skipping. Oh, he for was real? that. I mean, I don't know if he yeah. actually did it, but that's <laughs> the energy that I got yes. from him. He was so carefree. I mean, he, you know, he just was filled with joy. Yeah. I think that's who he is. Yeah. But obviously, you know, however many years later, 13, 14 years later, there's other things that have happened in life that have, he's not the same person. And I shouldn't expect that. But until you told me yeah. the, what, what the pastor said, I had never thought of it that way. Me too. I, I did the same thing when it came to Joel because, and think about us too. Yeah. You are a, you're, by the way, you're a completely different person than the person yes. I met yes. when you started working here. Yeah. You are, you're totally different. You're new. You come in with a million ideas. Mm-hmm. You're so in charge. You are so in charge. I am. Yes, you're in charge, man. You have this thing, which I found really admirable because you could walk into a place where you have learned the craft. You've learned this craft faster than anyone I've ever seen. You have the craziest news instincts that I 
I haven't seen with, with, with someone who hasn't been in this business for like 15 years. You're like, let's lead with that. Why don't we take a break here? Why don't we, all those little bits and pieces. But that's just how you've changed mm-hmm. professionally. Mm-hmm. But I was just thinking about the same thing back to me and Joel. It's like, it's the exact same thing. Joel doesn't like the same things he liked. Yeah. We always ate at the same place. I never really liked the place. Yeah. Why are we eating there again? Yeah. I never yeah. wanted it. The fr- I did it for you. Because now we're just being who we are. Yes. We're, stop- we're not pleasing anymore. Yeah, and I thought I thought his thought about really getting to know somebody, yes. and no matter who, like even parents, friends. parents. and friends and, and um, siblings, to really think like, okay, this is who I know you as, but you're not even, you don't, who are you now? Mm-hmm. I thought that that was brilliant. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. You know, it's so funny, a friend of mine who I haven't spoken to in like a few months called me just to talk and I said well tell me what happened and she said well my mom passed in September Mm. and it was like a knife in my heart you know when you realize Mm -hmm. that you weren't present for somebody's worst moment and she said I'm just gonna say one thing to you she said my mom told the same story a thousand times and we all rolled our eyes and she said just do this for me listen to your mom tell the story again whatever her story is listen and let her tell it to you again and again and again. She just talked about how fleeting it all is. And it just struck me in that moment because as we go through our busy lives doing what we do, someone lost somebody and all she wants to do is it's listen to, to the story. same story yeah. one, just one more time. Yeah, you know, um, Henry lost his dad during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And we watched this Harry Smith piece about um, a man and Henry's dad was um, had polio and was in a wheelchair Henry's whole life. And we watched this piece with Harry Smith together about um, this man living in a, in a wheelchair who was paralyzed later in life. And Harry said, well, how do you dream? Hmm. What are you doing in your dreams? And Henry burst into tears and said, why didn't I ever ask my dad what he dreamed about? Because his dad could walk, you know, could, and just wondering, like, and I think it it was such a, Mm. I said to, to him and to everybody, like, listen to that story, but also ask your parents or your grandparents yes. or whoever it, is, whoever it is, what they dream about. Yes. Ask them about what they were like when they were young. Yeah. Have those conversations yes. because you're right. You know, it's right. like time is fleeting. Right. Okay. Um, one of the other life lessons, and we learned a ton of them, was when um, my dear friend Maria and your dear friend Oprah <laughs> were <you>. together. <laughs> and I had so admired their friendship. But the thing that struck me was Oprah said that she only has – three Mm. friends and I think she has lots of acquaintances lots of people who know her lots of people who talk to her she has Maria she has Gail and she has Bob who was her trainer for many many years but is obviously her dear friend her circle is small and it's tight and I'm not sure if that's a trust thing like I know these people will always have my back or if that's all she needs so what's your like friend yeah what about Stedman Stedman's a, Stedman's, Stedman's a lover. You love yeah. her. Yeah. Um, I, you know, 
it's interesting because that surprises me yeah. because there's so many people that yeah. feel like Oprah is their friend, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I think it's like, you know, she's their yeah. friend, but she's yeah. these three solid. Yes, solid. Like North Stars yeah. almost. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I have that too, but mm-hmm. I do have a lot of friends. You do. Um, from a lot of different stages in life and some of whom I'm, you know, closer with than others. Yeah. But um, I mean, I I had parents and grandparents who really treasured friendships. I mean, both of my grandparents saw their best friend on the last day of their life. My grandmother had her best friend over to drink a Manhattan, her favorite oh. cocktail. And my grandfather's best friend, Jim Baker, snuck into the hospital with something to make a dirty martini. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I witnessed, like it was so ingrained in our, in my family, in the culture of our family, that friendship, I mean, they would say it in letters that I read from my grandmother. She asked about my friends. They included our friends in things. Right. So it's part of my DNA. So I don't know. It's interesting. I think I have space for probably more than three. Yeah. What about you? Um, I have a handful, but I do think when when someone new steps into my life, mm-hmm. like you, mm-hmm. I love the feeling. Like I think mm-hmm. I feel like I'm a better person because of that. Because I think you can keep your tight circle. We all have our two a.m. phone call. Yeah. Like who's your two a.m.? Yeah, probably Farrell. My, yeah. My longest. Yeah. And mine's probably Karen. Yeah. So it's we know who our two yes. a.m. phone and call Barbara is. And probably and you Barbara know, and Howard. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and <laughs> but, <yes. laughs> but you're right. But we've got that like that core group. But I do think I feel like I'm always enhanced when somebody new steps in yeah, and says, too. "Oh my gosh, I've got this." The other thing they talked about, Oprah and Maria both talked about, which is I think we both could use, is how important it is to just stop for a second and stop sprinting through your life. Um, this is what Oprah had to say. Women don't give themselves the right to rest. Yes. I remember, uh, yes, I was working with this meditation therapist uh, when I was doing tour last year, just before COVID hit hard. And we would do this big meditation in the arenas. And whenever he would say to the audience, you deserve rest, Mm. you could see tears flowing out of women's eyes. Men don't cry when they're told you deserve rest, but women start to weep because the very notion that you can give yourself permission to rest is is a foreign concept to so many women. Oh my gosh. You feel guilty when you rest sometimes. Yeah, it's so true. You don't, when do you rest? I mean, I try to get into bed as early as I can. Like sleep to me is, Rest. I like to go to bed early. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I try. I do. I try to find time to rest. Right. I had a mom who did not feel guilty about taking rest. Really? Like my so mom loved mean? to be in bed. Oh, she did. Like, and you know, meaning she would take, if she could, she would take an afternoon nap. No, she, yeah. she just didn't feel, my mom done, didn't feel a lot of guilt, no about, guilt. This, about those types of things. I'm sure she did maybe. She just didn't share Never, it with us. Yeah. But that... Like being in bed, we would be in bed on Saturday mornings and they'd read the paper and we would have our books. Like uh-huh. That wasn't something she felt bad about. She modeled taking time. I mean, yeah. that's why she asked why we were workaholics. Well, I do think that the sprinting through and tr- like I was looking at my um, my week this week and I was trying to block out some time yeah. that didn't involve anybody Yes. And it was almost impossible to find like one hour, one half hour. Just to like you just, read and I, or do whatever you wanted. And I started blocking it out just so I could try to do right something. Take a walk in the park. Do something that didn't involve. And I love my kids and I love Joel and all mm-hmm. the other stuff. But something that just gave you like a half a second yeah. just to be. To have some space. Because I feel like if you do allow for that space... You are better. Yeah. You're better at all yes. the other things. Yes. But she's so right. I know. And the fact that women wept, women wept when someone said, you deserve that. You've earned that. That's yours. And I think that's that might be a newer, that might be a newer thing yeah. too. Yeah. Because I think with, you know, and we see all these studies of mm-hmm. women just all, you know, in the last two years, yeah. exhausted, t- teaching their kids and yeah. taking care of their families yes, and also it. working from home. Yes. It's like, it, it's probably, it feels like it's come to a, a head almost. Yeah. 
Do you know that you, I know we've both had really long days, so we're all going to make space for ourselves right after this, but I just want to tell you my last guest on season one. I'm so happy to be here. We are going to have season two. We're so excited. We're launching season two. We have a whole array of awesome guests who have just beautiful life lessons just like you did, Jenna. Well, I'm so happy to be part of this because I know how happy it's made you. Oh, it's made my It's day. so fun to watch a friend light up at something that maybe wasn't even a possibility a couple years ago. So I'm so happy to be part of this awesome podcast. And usually on the show, I like to stroke your your graphic of your face, but <laughs> we'll just so, end there. Okay, let's end there. <laughs> Goodbye, Jenna. Bye. Welcome to our Tuesday edition of Pop Star Plus here on Today All Day. I'm Joe Fryer, filling in for Carson this week. We have a great show for you, including a lot of star power. We'll chat with Dwayne The Rock Johnson on his new movie, and Hoda has a heartfelt quoted by conversation to share with country legend Reba McIntyre. But before we get to all that, Chanel Jones has your first round of Pop Star Headlines. First up, Viola Davis oh, on Monday, Entertainment her. Weekly shared. Here we go, a first look at the actress as Michelle Obama. Whoa. This is in the upcoming Showtime series. It's called The First Lady. The Oscar nominee almost indistinguishable from the former mm -hmm. First Lady in the wow. sneak peek. Viola says that she actually spoke with Mrs. Obama before signing on to the project that will cover all eight years of her White House residency. And she's not the only one stepping into the shoes of a former First Lady. Here's another one. The upcoming anthology series will also include Michelle oh, Pfeiffer. Wow as Betty Ford. Cool. And this sneak peek, mm -hmm. Pfeiffer completely transforms into the wife of wow. our 38th president, known for her outspoken advocacy and personal battles with addiction. And taking it back almost eight decades in the White House, actress Jillian wow. Anderson as the nation's longest serving first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. Wow. Anderson rounds out the trio of first ladies set to be featured in the first season. The first lady is set to hit showtime early next year. That's okay. going to be a good one. All right, next up, People Magazine will soon find out who will be dubbed People's 2021 Sexiest Man Alive. But ahead of the big reveal, we have a special sneak peek at the guy being honored with the Morning After Saturday Night Live sexy title. <laughs> I didn't know it was a thing, but it's a thing. And it's none other than breakout star, SNL oh. star Bowen Yang. In the photo shoot, <laughs> he shows what it's really like to wake up from one of the cast's legendary post-show parties, even reveals how he likes to celebrate after the show on Saturday night. What's my usual vibe at the SNL after parties? Am I dancing? Yeah, not well, but I'm dancing. My go-to dance move is, you know what? It's just a step touch, and I'm gesticulating in various step ways. Touch. Al, that's your that's step step Al's step role. Step you know, that's the your... hitch. You know, this is where you live. The hitch. Step yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right just kind of, you know, you, you, you know, you Show them how it goes. Right there. Don't go far. Don't go far. None of this. Like this. <laughs> None of that. Not doing that. This is where you live. Right here. Right. You know, you should go to an SNL after party and do that move. I will if I ever get invited. Okay. Tune in tomorrow to find out who's proud. Who do y'all think is going to be? I wondered about that too. Do they have nominees? I don't know the nominees. No, he was last. No, he's already crowned. How about The Rock? Was he already? You know what? Yeah, that, oh, yeah, the Rock's having a good year. He's already he's been this year. Yeah. Yeah. We shall see. Probably. All right, coming <laughs> soon. All right, next up, Lance Bass. You said you saw this on Twitter. I did. The NSYNC singer recently sat down with husband Michael Turchin to play a game of genealogy trivia with Ancestry.com. And you'll never believe who Lance discovered he has a genetic connection to. Watch this. Which unexpected distant relative is part of Lance's musical family tree. A, Faith Hill. B, Britney Spears. Oh, I wish. <laughs> I wish. Or C, Elvis Presley. Who? B, Britney Spears. Are you? He just, me? yeah. 
That's, that's a great game. For real. So it turns out Lance Bass and Britney Spears are sixth cousins once removed. Oh, so am I. That... I mean, well, Lance, <laughs> what does that mean? I, mean, I don't know, the but there's heck? a connection. I mean, six so cousins we, we're once six removed? Cousins. Six cousins you know? and 12. Yeah, me and Lassie. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean Lassie. What is wrong with that your mind? That means nothing. But here's the thing. You <laughs> are you are directly yeah. related to Lenny Kravitz. How, yeah. how yeah. you are? Yeah. Six? Yes. How, how close are you and Lenny? His grandfather, my grandfather. So what does that mean? Third, fourth? I, 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 I don't get no, that's that. Closer that's closer than that. Closer, closer than Lance and Brittany, yes. for yeah. sure. That's well, real right. I don't know. And Lance says he's always felt a connection to Brittany, so he's happy that they're family. So it was a real surprise to find out that they're family. They have some good musical genes. All right, next up. <laughs> You know it, you love it. There aren't enough napkins in the world. It's buttery, it's salty. We're talking about movie theater popcorn. Best. For some reason, popcorn just tastes better in a buttery bucket. And soon, you'll be able to enjoy a tub of that pop perfection from the comfort of your couch. Wow. AMC Theaters is bringing their secret recipe to the supermarket shelf so you can buy it. The Cinema Giant will be serving their authentic, freshly popped popcorn from mall kiosks, convenience stores, to-go counters all over the country. Both prepackaged and microwavable mm. versions are set to hit stores next year. Will it come with the pump with the with the uh, with, with the, the butter? butter. Yeah. That's you know, that when you it, but liquid it's not, butter. It's yeah. not butter. It's what is it? Golden topping. It's a buttery product. I like it's my golden topping. It's like, it's like, it's golden golden it's like topping. six degrees removed. It's oh, yeah, from butter. butter. It's the yeah. Lance Bass and Britney Spears. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, popcorn toppings. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, finally. <laughs> Big news from our friends over at You're Dateline. On two, I know he's on fire today. On Tuesday, November 16th, Dateline will debut all six episodes of Keith Morrison's new original podcast, The Thing About Helen and Olga. This marks the first time listeners are, are going to be able to binge a whole Dateline podcast on its launch day. Now, in this story, two older women, Helen and Olga, who opened their hearts to down and out men in Los Angeles. This is true, of course. But after one of the men is killed by a hit and run driver and then another suffers the same fate, Investigators began to uncover a twisted plot. People are into this. The trailer is out today. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or by scanning the QR code on your screen now. And a reminder, you can watch new episodes of Dateline Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern right here on <laughs> oh. I listened to the thing about Pam. It was oh, yeah. riveting. Of course, this is Pop Start Plus, so here are a few more items for you. We'll start with Lady Gaga. For years, the pop star has been making her mark in fashion history, donning some of the most unique looks from being carried down the red carpet inside a giant egg to a head full of tentacles. And perhaps none was more iconic than the meat dress she wore to the 2010 MTV Music Video Awards. And she's breaking it all down in a recent interview with Vogue. We did want to make a statement because at the time uh, they were trying to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But we decided uh, to do the meat dress because I thought to myself, if you are willing to die for your country, what does it matter how you identify? And we were backstage with uh, Brandon Maxwell, who was working as one of my stylists at the time. He was vegan also and still helping to sew all of these last bits of meat to me and making my meat hat and my meat purse, which was held by Cher. And in case you're wondering, Gaga says, yes, the dress did in fact smell like meat, all in the name of fashion. Finally, we'll wrap things up with Ed Sheeran. Last night, the chart-topping singer stopped by The Tonight Show to catch up with Jimmy Fallon and chat about his newest album, Equals. But first, he swung by the Roots dressing room for a quick classroom instruments performance of his hit, hit song, Shape of You. Take a listen. It's official, it's impossible not to dance along to that song, even if it is performing on a banana maraca. Those are today's Pop Start Plus headlines. Just ahead, they don't come much bigger than the star of our next conversation, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Stick around. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Oh, More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news for hours since the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just did so. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news for hours. All right, it just did so. 
For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Dwayne Johnson is a man of many talents, a former WWE superstar, a talented actor. He even sings. In his latest film, Red Notice, The Rock is stepping into the role of an FBI agent, and he told us all about it. Special Agent John Hartley, FBI. In his new Netflix movie, Dwayne Johnson does what he does best, mixing comedy. We're work wives. We're not work We're wives. Sis sister wives. We're not any kind of wives. With a whole lot of rock and roll. In Red, Red Notice, Notice, Johnson plays an FBI agent hunting down the world's most wanted art thieves, played by Ryan Reynolds and Gal Gadot. There's nothing more tailor-made for you than this film. This is all your strengths. This is the action. This is the humor. This is you and Ryan Reynolds. I mean, did the chemistry just hit right when you guys stepped on the set together? Uh, just like that, uh, with myself and, and Ryan. I've known Ryan for a very long time, and we've been buddies. During these takes, you'll appreciate this. He is so disciplined that he will not break. He will stay in it. I, on the other hand, Mr. Discipline has arrived. I will laugh and ruin the takes, and the director will yell, cut. Take it easy. This is easy. And then Gall got it. I mean, she's amazing. Uh, and I love, one of my favorite quotes from her is like, she was scared to do a dance scene with you. She saw this big guy coming and she was like, I like my toes, man. I don't want someone crushing my toes. And then she, then she came to say that you were just like so light on your feet. So what was it like shooting with her? It was great, especially once I convinced her I danced like butter. Johnson's moves are paying off. He is one of Hollywood's top earning stars, and now he's topping the music charts with a new rap single. It's about drive, it's about power. We stay hungry, we devour. But at home, The Rock is a total softy and a proud girl dad to his daughters, five-year-old Jasmine and three-year-old Tia. Can you say, I'm a pretty girl? That's right, even more importantly than that, can you say, I'm an awesome girl. I gotta tell you, your Instagram makes me happy, man. Anytime I see you with your kids. <laughs> you drive Jasmine to school in the mornings, right? I do. Okay, tell me what's cranking up on the radio. What are they into? Every morning, Daddy, can you put on The Descendants? And I say yes, which is that Disney show, The Descendants. It's good to be he says recently Jasmine has realized just how famous her daddy really is. So now what she'll do is if she gets wind that someone is noticing me, we're at a park and kids are noticing or parents, she'll come up and grab me and she'll go, Dad, come on, they, they recognize you, come say hello, come on, you're the rock. So she pulls me over to this family and she's like, here, this is my dad. <laughs> this is my dad. And I was like, hello. <laughs> My daughter cry. wants me to come over and say hello to you. I want to cry. <laughs> it's the best. The Rock says everyone wasn't so gracious at the start of his career. Making the jump from wrestling to movies, Hollywood execs told him he'd have to drastically change the way he looked. I was told then, you can't eat as much, you can't be as big, you can't keep going to the gym, you can't call yourself The Rock. When you reflect on those old days when people told you to change it all and you stuck to it, what do you think about when you reflect back? One of the most powerful things we could be is just ourselves. I'm gonna be who I am and if, and if it doesn't work in Hollywood, then I could go to sleep at night and I'm gonna feel good about myself looking in the mirror. Today, his kindness to fans is legendary. All right, this should be fun. Hey, you guys know where I can find The Rock? He even stops for Hollywood tour buses. I said, whose house have you guys seen so far? And they were like, well, J-Lo lives here, and this person lives here. 
I said, have you guys seen my house yet? And they go, no. And I was like, great, keep it that way. And I drive off. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so cool. By the way, Oprah said, like, she was quoted in this Vanity Fair article about him, and she said one of the best things about him is he's a listener. And I noticed that. I mean, you don't really see that in the interview because I'm interviewing him. Sure. But he's the kind of person who's always asking you things and trying to interject because he wants mm. to know. Yeah. I mean, he's got the coolest vibe. Yeah. Red Notice is now in select theaters and begins streaming this Friday on Netflix. Coming up, Hoda's chat with the legendary Reba McIntyre sharing her favorite words of wisdom. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, oh. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just did too. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Who doesn't love country superstar Reba McIntyre? Well, Hoda chatted with her recently for our Quoted By series, and turns out part of what keeps Reba going, even through tough times, is having a sense of humor. It's really easy to get in a bad mood and get a little dark cloud over you. If I start thinking of all the things that I have that I'm, I'm very blessed with, then the clouds open and the sun shines through. All right, first of all, everybody in the world loves Reba McIntyre. I'm on the top of that list. And I always, look, I, one of the things I'm always curious about is if there's one single quote that kind of guides you. Reba, I mean, I know there are probably a ton that fit the bill, but what's your all-time favorite? I think what you gotta have in life is a funny bone, a backbone, and a wishbone. <laughs> That kind of encompasses everything. Which which of the bones is the most important to you of those three? Funny bones. <laughs> you gotta have a funny bone. Whether you're messing up or doing great, you gotta laugh at it and go on. And what is it you do, Reba, when you're going through kind of not a great day? How is it that you figure out how to turn the beat around? Well, I start being thankful for what I have. Um, it's because it's really easy to get in a bad mood and get a little dark cloud over you. If I start thinking of all the things that I have that I'm, I'm very blessed with, then uh, the clouds open and the sun shines through. Well, you bless every single person you come into contact with. Reba, oh, we, we love you so much. Thank you. I love your quote. You need three things to succeed in life, a backbone, a funny bone, and a wishbone. Reba, I love you. Love you too. I think about faith and I think about how it's really, truly helped get me through this pandemic. You know, mm -hmm. these are these are tough times. I kind of know my faith. It hasn't always been, you know, firing on all cylinders. <laughs> I've had questions. I've had doubts. But, um, you know, it's been there for me.
It's my lucky day when Harry Connick Jr. joins, quoted by uh, Harry is one of my pals. We share the love of New Orleans and the love of many things. But Harry, OK, everyone's got a quote, something that's kind of their guiding light. Uh, what's your quote? I thought about this. I knew I was going to be talking to you today and I don't want it to sound uh, conceited, but I actually have a quote that I wrote, which is from my new album. The, it's from a song. Uh, the song is called Alone With My Faith. The quote is, I don't have all the answers, but I have always known I'm eternally faithful, so I am never alone. Mm. That's chills. That's a chill. That's chills right there. Tell me how that gives you that kind of sense of peace. Well, faith is something I think is a gift that was given to us by God to compel us to communicate with him. And I think about faith and I think about how it's really truly helped get me through this pandemic. You know, mm -hmm. these are these are tough times and um, I've counted on my faith. It hasn't always been firing on all cylinders. <laughs> I've had questions, I've had doubts, but um, you know, it's been there for me and it's an evolving, wonderful gift. And it was important to, to write about faith. Yeah, I think that's so beautiful. And I think, you know, some people call it prayer. Some people just have conversations with God. What What is it for you? I think it's all of those things. Yeah. Um, for me, it, you know, I, I believe in God and I believe that, you know, God wants me to talk to him. <laughs> and um, I try to do that. I try to be honest and be the best person that I can mm -hmm. be. And in times like we've all just gone through, I, I find that to be very comforting. Yeah, I know, because this, I mean, the world is full of uncertainty. And once you have that locked in, you feel like, okay, we'll make it through this one, yeah. just like we made it through the other stuff. For me, it's about family and faith. And I know it's about that for you too, mm -hmm. and so many of your viewers watching now. If those parts are your, of your life are paramount and in order, then everything else just kind of falls into place. It doesn't mean you're not going to be disappointed or you're not going to endure hardships, but it sure makes handling things a little bit easier. It sure does. Well, I love that quote. I'm going to read it one more time. I don't have all the answers, but I have always known I'm eternally faithful. So I'm never alone. That's from your song, Alone With My Faith. Beautiful. Harry, we love you, man. I can't wait to see you in New Orleans soon. Lots of words to live by. After the break, we're continuing our wizarding journey into our Today Archive with an interview featuring Harry Potter stars Emma Watson and Rupert Grint. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's just shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's just shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. We're back and it's time for a fun chat from the vault where we dip into our Today Archive. 20 years ago, the world got its first glimpse at Harry Potter on the big screen with the release of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. And way back when, stars Emma Watson and Rupert Grint, who played Hermione and Ron, stopped by today to chat about their newly found fame. Watch this. Emma Watson and Rupert Grint, good morning. Nice Hi. to see you all. How exhausted are you? I mean, you've had pretty much of a whirlwind well, gosh, a whirlwind year, but the past couple weeks have been really crazy. What have you guys been up to? Um, we saw the premiere on Sunday. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was really, 
nerve wracking. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was you know, I, I I actually talked to Dan Radcliffe, who plays Harry in the movie, about that. I said, we're, and he said he was nervous. What was it? What what made you nervous about the premiere? There's so many people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, all the press, the people that were going, um, the cameras, the flashing. It was just. <laughs> scary. It was. Did yeah. a lot of people stop you and ask you for your autographs? Yes. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Now, yeah. Th at the New York premiere, you, Rupert, saw the movie for the fourth time, and Emma, you saw it for the third time, right? Because you yeah. also went to the London premiere. I did. Which was yeah. about a week ago. All right. Mm -hmm. In your very objective way, I'm sure you won't be, but tell me what you think of the film. Was it, when you saw the movie put together, was it what you expected it would be? Exactly. I, I feel like they've kind of just like taken a piece of my mind out from the book and just used it on the film because it's exactly as I imagined it. I, I mean, I, I suppose every actress when they like, see themselves on screen, they're like, oh, they cut out my best lines, or oh, I look so bad in that scene, or oh, my hair looks disastrous. <laughs> but I think everyone says that. So I'm very self-critical, but altogether, I just love the film. It's, it's, it's amazing. And, and, and But you were a little critical of your own performance at times? Yeah. I suppose every actress is. It's, it's, yeah, it just sort of yeah, goes so with the territory. What about, <laughs> what about you, Rupert, when you first saw the movie? I mean, because obviously you guys shot it over a period of nine months in bits and pieces. Lots of the shooting was done with, uh, with a green screen shh, because of special effects, <laughs> right? And uh, when you saw what they had done with it, with the music, with the editing and all that, what did you think? It was so cool. Yeah? It was really wicked, yeah. Wicked, that's your favorite word, isn't it, Rupert? Yes, what, was, yeah. there, was there anything different about the movie or anything that surprised you when you saw it all put together? Um, some of the special effects that we hadn't seen when we were filming it, they were in. It was really, really wicked. Yeah, now I know that you all um, had not had a lot of acting experience. I guess Rupert had a little more than you, Emma, when you got these roles. and. Uh, it, it was probably a little intimidating to work with someone like Chris Columbus. Um, tell me about your working relationship with him, because he had a lot of kids to contend with. Um, did you enjoy it, and, and how would you describe him as a director? One, two, three, he was just so supportive and nice. Yeah, he's, however, however much under pre pressure we were to get a scene done or whatever, he always had a smile on his face, and he's really good with working with children, and he mm. really got us into the moment, and he made us feel really, really comfortable. He's a great director. Was he ever really demanding of you, Rupert? I mean, did you ever think, ah, I can't believe I got myself into this, or for the most part, was he pretty patient? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was really patient. Because you guys are shooting the second movie already. Haven't you started filming the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets? Yeah, um, me and Dan have just been doing, like, the flying car bit. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm starting in December, so I'm really You're, Oh, so you haven't that. started yet. No, I haven't. But, um, How do you all do this and keep up with your schoolwork? I know that you have tutoring on the set, but you only do, what, how many hours of tutoring a day? Three hours at the minimum and five hours at the max. Yeah. And we don't get any homework, which is really cool. Yeah, I rolls. bet that's great. Yeah. <laughs> but is it hard to keep up with your work? I mean, while you're, because you must be exhausted doing all your acting and, and taking part in this movie. Is it, is it tough to stay on top of your studies? Um, no, we fi I, well, I find it um, quite easy because to keep up because it's like one to one and I think you learn more because there's not many distractions. Yeah. Right, and you really I have agree. to focus. Yeah, yeah it's, it's one to one so even though we do like half the amount that we would do in a normal school day, you get just as much work done because it's one to one and when you're in a class, you know, it takes a lot longer. Well, in the movie, you all are obviously fast friends along with Dan Radcliffe, <laughs> Harry yeah. Potter, and we've got a scene from the movie where you are um, actually working on perfecting your magic skills with a feather. Let's take a look. <laughs> One of the wizard's most rudimentary skills is levitation, or the ability to make objects fly. Wingardium Leviosa. Off you go, then. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Wingardium Leviosa. Stop, stop, stop. You're going to take someone's eye out. Besides, you're saying it wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. You do it then if you're so clever. Go on, go on. Wingardium Leviosa.
You go, girl. That Hermione is such a know-it-all, though, isn't she, Emma? Yeah. You, 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 I know, have said before that you're not like her at all, that, that uh, sh you and Hermione are actually complete opposites. Um, pretty much. Um, I reckon that Hermione is, is pretty bossy, pretty swatty, pretty teacher's pet, and I enjoy school, but I'm not obsessed with school. That's kind of the difference between us. And she <laughs> is obsessed with everything she's learning at Hogwarts. Yeah. Meanwhile, Rupert, I know you and Ron Weasley have a lot in common. Tell me about that. Um, when, when I was reading the books, I always felt like I could relate to Ron because we both got red hair, both like sweets. Um, we both got lots of brothers and sisters. I have one brother and three sisters, and we're both scared of spiders. And I know that you really wanted to play Ron because he may be a little wimpy at first, but he oh. really uh, pulls through when, when they need him to, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. doesn't he? Oh, yeah, the chess scene. Yeah, that was kind of like Ron's turn in the limelight, yeah. They were just kids, and two decades later, it's great to see both of them still thriving. Well, there you have it. That's today's Pop Start Plus. Join us again tomorrow. We'll be checking in with the one and only Ryan Reynolds. Have a great day, and we'll see you then. Today all day, Land. Welcome to our favorite digital show and yours, we hope too. Today at thirty. It's the best of the best from this morning show. We whittle it down to one little jam-packed half hour, all bite-sized, just for you. So here's what we're focusing on today: <laughs> what? the latest on the investigation into that tragedy at the Travis Scott concert in Houston. What we're learning now about safety concerns raised before the concert started. And the demand for answers is only growing. We went one-on-one -on -one with Houston's fire chief. We'll share that conversation. Also ahead, are you going to bed at the right time? Well, there's a new study, and it's shedding light on how the time you go to sleep can impact your heart health. We'll have a closer look at what you need to know to lower your risk of heart disease. And then Jill Martin will be by to introduce us to an inspiring entrepreneur who hit the jackpot by moving from the legal world to the frozen food aisle. Holy Jill. I mean. All right, and on the fourth hour, we tackled some quick and fun DIY hacks for Thanksgiving that your whole family can get involved with. All right, I'm all ears. Corn ears, you know, for Thanksgiving. <laughs> is corn a Thanksgiving dish? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Well, see, Same so corn. it works. Time for Today, Today in 30. 30. In a moment, we will speak to the chief of the Houston Fire Department, but first, NBC's Morgan Chesky is standing by with the very latest. Hey, Morgan, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning. And as the memorial for those eight victims grows, so does the scrutiny into figuring out how this even could have happened in the first place. Police are now calling this a criminal investigation, enlisting the help of both the narcotics and the homicide divisions to try and find some answers here as some concert goers fight to stay alive. This morning, every frame of Astro World Fest video painting a more disturbing picture of the deadly crowd surge and scrutiny on the response to the massive crowd. Houston police say more than 500 officers and 750 security guards were on site. Yet even with two reported emergency plans, it wasn't enough. Houston's police chief even visiting Scott personally before the show, expressing concerns regarding public safety. Somewhere in this crushing sea of fans, eight victims who lost their lives. One of them, 21-year-old Axel Acosta. The weight of the crowd literally suffocating him. Axel died as a result of the phenomenon known as crowd rush. His father, heartbroken. I love my son. It could be you. It could be you. The family joining a growing number of lawsuits. Tell lies, don't tell lies, someone. What was happening inside that crowd? Just a complete loss of control. I mean, like, even I'm a big guy and I couldn't, I couldn't control where I was going. While not accused of doing so Friday, Scott's no stranger to inciting crowds. In 2015, the rapper pled guilty to reckless conduct after allegedly encouraging fans to rush the stage in Chicago. And in 2017, similarly pled guilty to disorderly conduct after allegedly urging fans to jump barricades at an Arkansas concert. After Friday's tragedy, Scott said he was devastated announcing he will cover all funeral costs and provide further aid. The Blunt family praying for all the help they can get. Nine-year-old Ezra was on his father Treston's shoulders before falling into the crowd. The crowd just starts going crazy and Treston goes, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Now Ezra is in a coma, 
his hopeful family by his side. It's just a lot of things that could have prevented that. And it's, it's really no excuse for it. And we've learned this morning that Travis Scott will not be performing at this weekend's Day in Vegas event. The pop star saying that he is too distraught to play. He is also promising to fully refund anyone who bought a ticket to the Astroworld concert. And we're hearing from popular star Drake as well, who was set to perform that Friday night. He's saying that he is heartbroken for all the families and friends of those who lost their lives. Savannah. Morgan, thank you very much. And joining us now is Houston's Fire Chief Samuel Pena. Chief Pena, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Savannah. It's just been a few days, but do you have any better idea of what may have initiated, what have caused the crowd to start stampeding the stage? Savannah, first of all, I'd like to uh, express our condolences to the families of the deceased, and certainly our prayers are with them and, and the injured that still remain in the hospital. So the, the investigation is still ongoing. It's, uh, you know, it's still in its infancy, for sure, but uh, we're, we're getting, uh, starting to get some picture of, of what may have caused the uh, this incident. Um, it seems that as though um, the crowd began to to try to push towards the front to get as close to the uh, stage as they could uh, when when Mr. Scott's set began. And what was happening is is the uh, barricades that were placed in to prevent that surge towards the stage, in essence, caused uh, other areas of pinch points. And, and as the crowd began to surge and push and compress towards towards the front, it was those people in the center that began to that began to get uh, uh, crushed and and the injuries start to begin. And we're still trying to determine what caused the uh, the crowd to begin that surge, but uh, certainly we're um, we're looking at everything. We're participating with the Houston Police Department, who's taking the lead on this investigation, and and. Um, we owe it to the families, and certainly we uh, we need to ensure that this does not happen again. Your department and the Houston Police Department declared a mass casualty event at approximately 9.38, the first patient treated by your paramedics two minutes later, and yet the music reportedly continued <clears throat> until 10.15. Do you think someone should have called off the concert? Would that have helped uh, minimize the injuries here? Well, look, um, there, there's certainly uh, a lot of questions to be uh, to be answered there. We did declare a mass casualty uh, incident a little after 9.30. And, you know, I, I, uh, I'm i glad we were pre-positioned ahead of time, even though the plan did not recall or call for that, uh, for that to happen. We had resources on scene monitoring the conversations. We had some units that uh, were, were pre-deployed and some that were requested soon after the, our incident commander there was beginning to hear the chatter and the uh, incident escalate. So we were able to quickly respond as soon as, as we knew that the, that the private company that was providing the, the medical component became overwhelmed. But, but let me ask um, you, because you had actually been quoted in the New York Times saying the one person who can really call for and get a tactical pause when something goes wrong is that performer. They have that bully pulpit and they have a responsibility. So let me be very blunt about it. Do you believe the performer, Travis Scott, should have called an end to the concert once he saw what was taking place in front of the stage? Look, absolutely. Look, we all have a responsibility. Everybody in that uh, at that event has a responsibility, starting from the from the artist on down. And uh, certainly, as soon as uh, they became aware, and there was evidence that uh, that the crowd itself was trying to approach some of their private security, some of the security that was in that uh, it, 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 closer to that stage, <clears throat> that something was wrong. Um, at one point, we there was an ambulance that was trying to make its way through the crowd, um, and he's got. The, you know the artist has command of of that uh, of that crowd. Uh, in my opinion, and this is my opinion right now, because everything is going to be uh, uh, fleshed out throughout this investigation. But uh, certainly, um, a the artist, if, if he notices something that's going on, he can certainly pause that that uh, performance, turn on the lights, and said, "Hey, we're not going to continue until." until this thing is resolved. That's one way to do it, yes. And just just a, one more point on this issue. Do you have any evidence, do you have any reason to believe that the performer or anyone on stage initiated or encouraged this rushing of this stage? You know, we've obviously reported there have been a couple prior guilty pleas by Travis Scott. 
with this kind of conduct, this is a separate night, a separate incident. Is there any evidence that you've collected that suggests in any way he initiated this? No, not at this point. I'm not uh, prepared to say that. Um, I'm not prepared to say that he was fully aware of, of the uh, of what was going on. All I'm saying is that um, everybody at that event, from the artist on down, security, and everybody that's that's there to provide uh, uh, public safety, uh, including the crowds, right? Uh, in general, we all have a responsibility when we attend these venues to ensure each other's safety, and and um, and so everybody is 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 a uh, work community uh, at these events and and all these are going to be all these answers uh, are, are going to be provided hopefully as soon as the investigation is completed but uh, we really need to take a critical look at at uh, everything that went on there because we cannot have this happen again here in the city or anywhere yeah Absolutely. And, and eight people having lost their lives. Uh, the stakes couldn't be higher. Houston Fire Chief Samuel Pena, thank you for your time this morning, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Y'all be safe. Stick around because there is much more coming up on Today in 30. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just did so. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back this morning on In-Depth Today, how sleep affects your heart health. Of course, the pandemic has disrupted the nightly habits of many Americans, present company included. <laughs> uh, now researchers are revealing one way to reduce your risk of heart disease, and it boils down to a very specific bedtime. Really mm -hmm. specific. NBC's Carrie Sanders, jo Sanders joins us with the story. Hi, Carrie. Morning. Good morning. I'm not in my bedroom, guys, here. This is the Miami Sleep Life Center here. And every night, different I'll patients come in and they hook them up to these leads to determine and analyze how their sleeping patterns are. Well, now there is a new study that shows it's not only about getting eight hours of sleep, but when you go to sleep. And there is a relationship between when you go to sleep and heart disease. By now, we all know mom was right. Going to bed and getting a good night's sleep makes it so much easier to get through the day. But now, new research shows the exact time you go to bed could determine how healthy your heart beats. The European Society of Cardiology's latest study shows falling asleep between 10 and 11 p.m lowers the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, warning early or late bedtimes may be more likely to disrupt the body clock. The study, which followed 88,000 people in the United Kingdom for nearly six years, found night owls who went to bed after midnight had a 25% higher risk, while surprisingly, those who said goodnight before 10 o'clock had a 24% higher risk when compared to those who fell asleep in that golden hour between 10 and 11 p.m. The connection between clocking what time you go to sleep and cardiac risk even more pronounced among women. 
people have a tendency to more think of cognitive health when they think of sleep. But remember something, when you're asleep, it's kind of giving your heart a little bit of a break to rest and relax and be ready for the next day. So when you shorten that time, your heart, unfortunately, doesn't get the rest that it needs. Americans still adjusting to life after COVID lockdowns report they're increasingly finding it a struggle to get the snooze time they need. Since the pandemic began, researchers around the globe have seen a surge in sleep disorders. Two of every three American adults report they're sleeping more or less than they want to. How can you combat what they're calling coronasomnia? Set a timer on your phone to remind you that it's time to go to bed. Number two, have an accountability partner. The third one is don't do anything before bed where you lose track of time, like scrolling on your phone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Carrie, what is it about this golden hour between 10 and 11, an hour none of us has ever seen before, <laughs> that makes it so much healthier for your heart? <laughs> Well, you know, the folks who did this study looking at people sleeping like this, following all of their monitoring, realized that it has something to do with the circadian rhythms that we have when we go to sleep. They don't have a direct causation figured out yet. That's the next part of the study. But as you pointed out, guys, some people do not go to bed in that golden hour for good reason, mm -hmm. right? That's right. Yeah. Carrie, yeah. thank you. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. I'm not sure who should read the prompter because it's just a broker. Oh, that's so funny. Anyway, uh, <laughs> here on the third hour of today, it's a fun morning. We've got my brother, Chris Roker, uh, co-hosting with us. And our sister to the show, Jill Martin, is here now with a great She Made It, an attorney who found a new passion in waffles. I love this. And I just love being here with you. It's like being, it's like seeing double. He's been teasing you He's as much as I'm doing. He's teasing me in the green room. I mean, it's like the same thing. All right. So good morning, everybody. I'm going to introduce you to an amazing entrepreneur, who made her way from the law firm to the frozen food aisle. Take a look. I've always had this mentality with this company, why not? What's the worst that could happen? Why not give it a shot? Emily Grodin always plans to be a lawyer. Your story is so interesting, especially because I grew up with a lawyer in the family who only wanted to do woodworking in the garage. I sort of had that deja vu of watching somebody do something, knowing that their passion and love was for something else. I was that little girl, age 10, walking around telling everybody that I wanted to be a corporate lawyer. 2015, I joined a big corporate law firm in Chicago and very quickly realized that this was not something that I was passionate about. Emily's real passion was food. One night she was watching Chef's Table on Netflix and decided to take a leap of faith. 
in the second season, there was an episode about Alinea, the three Michelin star restaurant in Chicago. It was a couple miles from my home and I found the co-founder of the group's email address shot him a cold email. He wrote me back 18 minutes later. And two weeks after that, I was hired as the general counsel of the Alinea Group. So you get this job. Now it seems like, okay, maybe your two passions are merging. And then what happened? I was really lucky to be be able to blend my career with my hobby. About seven months into my job, I was listening to a podcast that was talking about the frozen breakfast market and how it is still so dominated by these players who have been around for 10, 20, 30 years, kind of making the same products that aren't particularly healthy for you. At the time, Emily was also expecting her first daughter and thought as a working mom, a frozen waffle would be an easy and convenient breakfast for kids and parents alike. I was inspired to take matters into my own hands. I started playing with recipes in my home kitchen, trying to fit as many nutritious ingredients into a waffle that I could. By August 2019, Emily began cooking out of a commercial kitchen and even had her first vendor, a local corner store in Chicago. And although it was a brand new business, Emily pitched evergreen waffles to Whole Foods. I thought, even if they say no, maybe I'll get feedback on the texture or the packaging or the pricing. And uh, they accepted me as a local vendor. So, wow. Yep. So, I found out October of 2019 that I would hit shelves in Whole Foods in March of 2020. And if you think back to March of 2020. (laughs) Oh, I know. So, did that work for you? Really, people were buying whatever they could get their hands on, particularly in the frozen aisle. So I think that in those early weeks, I, a bunch of people grabbed evergreen off the shelves that maybe wouldn't have given us a chance otherwise. Evergreen Waffles is now in over 60 Whole Food stores. And with another top secret major retailer deal underway, they'll be quadrupling the number of doors they're in by January 2022. So we haven't gotten into really the potion of your waffles. What makes them so unique? I wanted flavors that, you know, I would wake up in the morning excited to go heat up and eat myself. We have a zucchini and carrot, which is kind of a cross between a zucchini bread and a carrot cake. We have a peanut butter and banana. We have a mixed berry and almond. We have a chocolate chip and matcha. And then we have a pumpkin and pecan for all the pumpkin spice lovers. In this whole process, what was your biggest blessing? I have two young daughters and I hope that they watch me build this company and learn that they can do whatever they want with their careers. And also realize that if they start down one career path and they're not feeling fulfilled, it's never too late to change directions. Hmm. You know, it's such a beautiful story because Mm -hmm. she said it's never too late to follow your passion. I mean, was a lawyer, her family, you know, from lawyers, Mm -hmm. and then became a waffle maker. So now you're trying them. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think? They're healthy, made with 10 and 11 ingredients from scratch. We each like a different one. That's right. Good fiber. Yeah, I like the peanut butter banana. See, I like that one. I like the blueberry. Yeah, you blueberry. like the blueberry? Of course. Yeah. Oh, do you know why I like it, Jill? Because some, you know, you try not to do processed food or whatever, but some days, look, you just need to go to the freezer yep. and you need to be able to get something. And, boom. and, and yeah. so if this is something where it's guilt-free, 11 ingredients or 10 ingredients. And to give to your kids, and you could use it as a dip, and look at the packaging. It comes in a bag with a reusable seal. So you know how, you know, in a box, sometimes you get free, uh, like yep. freezer, freezer burn. burn. Yeah, yeah that's right. All Jill, right. thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. 
Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. My forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. Didn't fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Thanksgiving will be here before you know it. I know we've kind of given Thanksgiving a sort of a, a short the, shrift, a side eye. Yeah, Not this no. year. Okay, we're kicking off our Hacksgiving so the you side eye. don't have to wing it on the holiday. <laughs> All right, we're going to help you create some fun and fabulous Thanksgiving Day decor. And guess where we turn for inspiration? TikTok, of course. It's where we turn for everything. And here to show us some of the most popular trends is lifestyle expert and host of HSTV.com. Yvette, Yvette Rios. Rios. Hi. Yvette. So oh, my gosh. You're finding inspiration on TikTok, oh, too? Oh, there is so so much stuff on TikTok, it's unbelievable. No, we've got okay, look let's at I mean, the, yeah, let's start with our first, uh, our first trend. Yeah, okay. this is decorated candles. Yes. So this is actually one that I came up with. Um, so basically, what you do is you can use any sort of image and transfer onto tissue paper. I just drew these. Yeah. But basically, you use wax paper. So tissue paper on top of a candle. You no. place it where you want. Oh my, yes. Okay, let, oh, stop, stop. Can I try? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heat it up, girl. So turn up, turn on that con air. There you go. Oh, oh wait, no, no, no. Oh. Yeah, oh yeah, there you go. Sorry. And then <laughs> you just heat it up right on there and, and you just kind of press it. The wax from the cool. wax paper actually <laughs> transfers it. the design. So you need to do it a little bit longer, yeah. but like look at these. Kind of cute. That's super cool, cute. right? Oh my gosh. Awesome. Yes. Right, easy, let's easy. Move over to these um, candy corn, the leftover candy corn that nobody yeah. wants to eat. Nobody oh wants it. So by the way, I am a fan of the candy corn. <gasps> what? I wait, really you're am. All I, by yourself. I've never heard anybody say that. I love the buttery sweetness, but anyway. Anyway, so I'm not going to admit it, I guess, uh, to well, you, you guys, just but did. I, yeah, I'm okay. sorry about So wait, that. what do you do here? So Okay, so these are little flower pots. You can make these in any size. This is like little favors for the kids. If you have a kid's table, oh, it's a cute way, little super, thing to put. Cute. And so wait, how do you do it? We missed so that So easy, easy. Just grab one of these little yeah. terracotta pots, a little bit of hot glue. Yeah. Hot glue is yeah. like your best friend. Yeah, it's okay. my best friend. And then you're just going to put a few leaves. And where do you get those leaves? leaves? Just at Honestly, any craft store. Yeah, craft store. And then you just kind of put them. And a couple of them makes a little tail. Oh, gosh. It's cute. super cute. Love it. And easy. Fill it with whatever candy. You draw a little face on. What candy do you do if, it's if my you side. have a leftover gourd? So. <laughs> nobody has ever asked. I know. That's a very, that's very good nobody question. Nobody ever. So this is such a cool idea that I found on TikTok. Let's so you see. basically take these, you spray paint them with just white matte spray paint, and then you can make these really cool and funky like birds. birds. Oh, oh my God, look a little Doesn't that look like a bird? No, isn't that super cool? And these are beautiful Peacock. like on your mantle or as a centerpiece. Easy breezy. By the way, that's, that's so really simple. cute. Isn't that and simple? would be pretty on the tabletop. Right? And I just love the all white with the natural touch. Mm -hmm. It's really classic. Okay. All right, let's move on to leaf. <laughs> to leaf. Yes. What is that? Leaf a wreath. wreath. A leaf wreath. Okay, so this one I found. No, wait, say that again five times. <laughs> the leaf wreath, leaf wreath. <laughs> the leaf wreath. So this I thought was pretty cool. It involves a little bit of folding and paper cutting. So they actually fun. had yeah. the template. It's super fun for kids. So they had the template on um, their website, but you just fold them up and then you're just going to hot glue it. This is a pizza box that I just cut up and then you're just going to hot glue the leaves on there mm -hmm. and it's easy breezy too. You know, no big deal and you, you've got them here and one mounted over and there. this is when it's done. It's really pretty. It is pretty. By the way. Yeah. Okay. That's cute. Yeah. Right. I like that. Not event. bad. Not bad. Right, okay. I know. TikTok. Um, some Napkins. Okay, so here, this one is for this one is for both of you. We're gonna show, I'm gonna show you guys how to do the rose. Here, fold. I'll do this. Oh, oh yeah, perfect. Rose okay. napkin? Yes, exactly. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna roll up. Oh, this is not gonna be good. No, we're not good at rolling. We're not good at. No, you crafts. guys are great. Okay. And then you're gonna go to one side, so that's perfect. Now okay. you're gonna grab one side and you're just gonna roll it like this. So start over it's here. Like a yeah, roll. exactly. Like, oh, wait, wait, oh you wow, you really rolled. Oh, oh. Yeah, leave a little tail. So wait, you okay. just stuff it in, or you? No, you just kind of take it from one side and just roll like it this? like. Well done, ladies. Just like okay, like like it's like you're rolling up. Yeah, one. perfect, okay. perfect. And then perfect. what do you do? And then once you're at the end. You're gonna tuck your little this little tail. Mm -hmm. You just tuck it into the little side over here. This is satisfying, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it feel but good? Mine does not look no, like that's yours. beautiful that's right. though. And, then, what do you and do? then you take the tails like this and you flip them out. Inside here. Yeah. See, so it's like a little rose. So then, how did you yeah, do that? See, it's like. Wait, how did you turn that? Okay, wait here, here. So wait, you got this, pull right? Pull this down. For some reason, you see. There you go. You got it. You got oh. it. Okay. Pretty. That's beautiful. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's beautiful. By the way, that's really, and that's simple. It's so Even, simple. No, it is. That's I know. Pretty. Super cute. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Yvette. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. As you can see, that's it was funny. a busy morning, and we have another one for you tomorrow. Two words for you. Ryan <gasps> Reynolds, three words, babe. He'll join us live right here in Studio 1A. Yeah, I called him a babe. All right, you did. All right, we can't wait for it. Don't miss it tomorrow. Have a great Tuesday. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Do you ever just look around and say, I can't believe we did this? And that was like the light bulb moment. I got up there and I just said I quit my job and started this company. And I just kept going. It was a lot of testing and learning. There's been a lot of tears along the way. We can actually change the world. When did you have the moment, I made it, I did it? Wow, we've met some amazing women over the years in our continuing series, She Made It. We've shared so many stories of female innovators and entrepreneurs who have overcome challenges, never took no for an answer, and ultimately made it. And for the next half hour, we'll tell you about women making their mark in the beauty and fashion industries, from female founders solving hair and skin problems, to two moms who have figured out a way to shop seamlessly for your kiddos, and so much more. Plus, I'll reveal my She Made It It list, small businesses I've been obsessed with. I know you're going to want to shop and support. And you know, because it's me, I have some major deals for you just for our Today All Day viewers. Just go ahead and scan that QR code, you know I love a QR code, at the bottom of the screen for instant shopping as we go, or just head to today.com slash shop. In 2019, I met up with a woman who had a vision and a passion, and it wasn't just lip service. Melissa Butler took a leap and gave up a promising job to create the Lip Bar, a line of lipsticks that isn't just about the color, but what goes into every product. Melissa is as bold as her lipsticks, and I found out how she made it. Our very first collection was literally 12 shades of the rainbow. I love the store just nestled in this little alley in Detroit. You find all these beautiful colors and it was just such a happy place. I really tried to create a super safe space for not only the beauty community, but just women everywhere. We want to remind people constantly that they don't have to transform in order to be beautiful. They're already beautiful. They're already enough. In 2012, when Melissa Butler was 26 years old, she launched The Lip Bar, a collection of lipsticks and lip gloss, hoping to change the beauty industry by using only natural, vegan, and cruelty-free ingredients. I noticed a huge gap within the beauty industry, its lack of diversity, its excessive amounts of chemicals, and instead of complaining about it, I decided to do something about it. Melissa started her career working in finance, 
But at night, she began turning her kitchen into a laboratory. I think I learned how to make lip balm first. I started learning about carrier oils and essential oils and just like the chemical composition of lipstick and started experimenting in my kitchen. Where did you even start with that? I wouldn't even know where to begin. I started reaching out to cosmetic chemists because I knew that I didn't know anything about the beauty industry. I started reading the ingredients on products that I was already using and started just like doing extractions from there saying like, oh, this sounds like a good ingredient. Let's do some research on it. And I just kept going, literally, like, I'm calling my mom, my sisters, my cousin. I'm like, can you try this on? So it was a lot of testing and learning. I think I worked on the product for about 18 months um, in full before we launched the actual business. Once she perfected her product, she traded her lucrative job on Wall Street for the risky life of an entrepreneur even pitching her product on Shark Tank. The night before our big launch party, I was making very small batches, like hand pouring them. And so I was up until probably like four in the morning making lipstick because I was making changes. Her business started taking off thanks to online sales. And now with 48 colors in her line, Melissa says there's a shade for every skin tone. Our colors are so much fun because we name them after personalities. So we have Boss Lady. That color is gonna give you enough confidence to take on the day and own the room. And then we have colors like Party Girl. So we really just try to, to meet our customer where she is. And Melissa's hard work is paying off. The Lip Bar is now in 450 Target stores nationwide. We're worth about $7 million now and it's wild. I dreamt up this idea in my bedroom and I'm just grateful that I've had the opportunity to be a part of like a very changing industry. So a great update. Since we last spoke to Melissa, we've learned that the lip bar has grown from lipsticks to a full collection of makeup for every complexion and shade. And guess what? The lip bar is offering an exclusive deal for our Today viewers, 25% off their products with the code TODAY25. How amazing is that? And we're so happy to see this business growing. Okay, now, just like finding the perfect lip color, a lot of people can relate to the struggle of finding the perfect hair products. They're not one size fits all, as we all know. I met one suburban Chicago mom from a multicultural family whose daughters all have different hair types. When she couldn't find something that worked for her family, she made it. Five years ago, I was struggling through bath time. I looked around and I saw like 70 bottles of shampoo and styling products. And I was like, there's gotta be a better way to do this. You know, Nobody should have to really go through this trial and error and expense. Ina Hennigan says she was frustrated with the large amount of hair care products in her multicultural household. A frustration that actually goes back to her own childhood. My father was African-American, my mother was Caucasian, and she had straight red hair. Had really never had to deal with anything like mine. <laughs> Hennigan says she and her mother always struggled with her hair. We had a lot of tears, a lot of anger, and she had so few resources to turn to for help and education and caring for my hair. And then I became the mom of three multi-ethnic daughters, and they all had a completely different texture of hair. My oldest daughter has practically straight hair, like her dad and like my mother had. Zoe has wavy hair. Her hair is dry, but it's not nearly as dry as mine or sister's. Naomi has very similar to mine. Curly, thick, very dry hair, craves moisture. I mean, there really weren't any that I could find. Premium natural products that were made specifically for those of us who are multiracial and multicultural. And I couldn't find what I was looking for, so I created my own. Hannigan, a family physician, began taking a closer look at the labels of the products around her home. And found stuff that was really harsh and, and synthetic. Why would I want to put that on my kid's head? She shared her concerns with a friend, who happened to be a cosmetic chemist, and together, they looked for natural ingredients that would work on multicultural textured hair. I wanted to use innovative ingredients. Hennigan spent several years juggling her medical practice while creating and testing formulas on her own daughters. And I would know by the condition of their hair after washing that their hair is coming out a little too dry or, you know, why not taking care of frizz. We saw a lot of interesting things in our bathroom every other week, but it was really, really neat and special to find something that actually worked. By 2017, after three years of development, Hennigan finally launched her line of non-toxic hair care products called Many Ethnicities. Our products have no glutens, no parabens, no dyes, no harsh salts, no phthalates, 
Never any animal testing ever. And two years later, they are now being sold on major websites like Amazon and Walmart. I saw this need and wanted to do something about it. I mean, really, that was my biggest inspiration was my kids. I know there are so many moms and so many families out there that are like ours, and I want to just make hair care simple and not spending so much time worrying about hair care. And am I putting safe, healthy products on my kids' hair and heads? How awesome is this? After we met Dr. Ina in 2019, many ethnicities saw their largest day of sales and revenue to date and have continued to grow as a brand year after year. Recently, they've launched two new products and I've got them right here for you. They're Power Curl Styling Jelly and Freedom Curl Refreshing and Detangling Spray. Perfect compliments to their original products. And with the promo code today, JM30, today all day viewers receive 30% off. Remember to scan that QR code on the bottom of your screen. And we should mention that today makes a share of revenue from your purchases. All right, coming up, mom knows best, right? And we'll meet two of them who are changing how parents shop for their kitties' clothing. Plus, two friends who turned a little hanky panky into a multi million dollar business. And we've got more deals on the way, so don't go away. We'll see you soon. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to our special She Made It. I know so many parents who talk about the stress of buying clothing for their kids. Christina Carbonell and Galen Bernard were two of them. They didn't want logos or clothes designed for boys or girls, so these moms figured out a colorful way to make shopping fun and easy. I spoke with them back in 2019 about their company making kids their primary focus. This sells so well for boys and girls. We are normalizing the fact that it's okay for boys to wear pink and purple, or the fact that not all girls want to wear sparkles. For friends, colleagues, and moms, Christina Carbonell and Galen Bernard, the idea behind their children's clothing brand, Primary, was a personal one. I have twin girls who don't like pink and purple, and I had to buy them boys' jackets because they wanted orange, and that at that point it was 2015, felt so silly. So tell me the premise of primary. To help every kid feel confident in who they are without prescribing what colors are boys and girls colors and without prescribing what styles boys and girls should wear. The duo saw an open space in the market for gender neutral, affordable clothing for kids. You find this white space mm -hmm. and you say to each other, what? Huh. We can do this differently. Yeah. We're parents first. We want to create a solution. That takes a lot of guts yeah. to leave your job yeah. for totally. basically an yeah. idea in your head. It felt terrible to think about not ever trying this. And it felt okay thinking about like if we tried it and it didn't work, we would be able to go find something else. And so I think that and like a little bit of a Thelma and Louise, like let's hold hands and like <laughs> right. do this, just like made it sort of a no brainer. Did you have money in the bank at the time or was this like a... No, we had nothing. It was a risk. Right. <laughs> As the two women started to raise funding, they faced an unexpected question. We did get the question actually really early on whether our husbands were funding it. 
which is just an interesting like perspective, but that wasn't the case for us at all. Like, oh, you're leaving your jobs or your husbands? We knew that we would have to raise venture capital to fund this business. That's very intimidating. It's not something that we had experience with, but we were lucky um, to have mentors and advisors who could guide us through that process. Christina and Galen used every connection they had to set up meetings. We got 100 no's and we got two yes. <laughs> so tell me about your first yes. I was sitting at lunch and the email came in with the actual term sheet. These things aren't real until you see it in writing and I started crying. And that was like the first real like, oh, this is like really happening. We really did it. They launched their direct-to-consumer platform in 2015. We launched in sort of an extremely simple place. Only solids, super soft fabrics and a rainbow of colors. No logos, no slogans, no sequins, which was really important and still is. That simplicity piece where there aren't tags and there aren't seams. The bottom line, this year their business for babies and kids has doubled. You don't have to be 25 to launch a business. <laughs> In starting a business, it's a big benefit to have had life experience, to have had business experience. It's almost like the same advice I got when I was thinking about having kids, which was there's no perfect time. It's right. never going to be like, oh. We view ourselves as the Crayola of kids' clothing. <laughs> They're essentials that every kid needs that uh, are colorful and fun, and you can't go wrong. Well, this is so inspiring because despite a difficult year for many businesses, Primary grew by 30% in 2020. They told me that they owe their success to their strong, loyal customer support. And how cute are these little clothing? And for our today viewers, Primary is offering 30% off plus free shipping on your first order. Just use the code TODAY30. All right, switching gears, our next She Made It is about the story of two women whose friendship spans more than five decades and their multi-million dollar business that has been around for almost as long. And it all started with the thong. Meet the ladies of Hanky Panky. The name on everyone's hips is our tagline, but we were actually the word on everyone's lips and people were talking about us. <laughs> You must still marvel when you both walk in here and say, I can't believe we did this all, right? Every day, yes, I think we do. <laughs> Gail Epstein and Lita Orzak have led their intimate apparel company for more than four decades. Their colorful wares continue to be a hit amongst women. This little crotchless thong is a bestseller. Crotchless is our most searched for word on our website. Okay. Really? Their business is rooted in friendship that dates back to New York City in 1964. Well, we met during our college years. Gail had moved from St. Louis and I was a New Yorker. And we were introduced through somebody who was uh, Gail's friend in St. Louis growing up, who became my best friend at college. As they got older, each went off to chart her own path. Gal as a sweater designer, Lita as a researcher in social psychology. But a moment of inspiration came when Lita turned 30. How did the friendship develop into a business partnership? The beginning was a gift, a birthday gift that I gave to my BFF. Gal had taken embroidered handkerchiefs and fashioned them into handmade lingerie. This isn't the actual one. She wore it out. Yeah, but, <laughs> but this is what it looked like. It was a little bra, a little bikini set, cute as can be and so original and I don't know we started talking about I love this other women would love it was that the aha it was the first thing that really um, initiated the thought that we could take something bigger and in 1977 Hanky Panky was born once you get a name for something it kind of drives the whole thing so that really is the perfect name they hit the ground running Gail sewed while Lita called department stores to begin booking orders. Gail literally taught me what production was all about. She sat down at a sewing machine in her sample room and made 12 dozen bras and 12 dozen bikinis because this order was going to 12 branches of Lord & Taylor. She made them all. And Lita delivered them to the dock. So <laughs> that's the way it was done. They were successful but it took another 10 years for what they call their game changer. When was the point where this sort of blew up? And that was in 1986. I designed the first thong. And what led up to that point was spandex had been developed. It was the incorporated into many different fabrics, including laces. There were other thongs in the market that were not 
comfortable, and my goal was to create something that was perfection. We didn't even have computers here. We were still entering orders by hand, and there was literally, you know, everyone talking to each other. Oh my God, I found this comfortable thong, and that is how the business grew. Their classic thong style 4811 eventually grabbed a huge following, along with a 2004 headline in the Wall Street Journal. And that bestseller helped grow the company into a $50 million business. Full disclosure, I grew up on Hanky Panky. I grew, I'm wearing it right now. It's a PG show. Um, what would you say is the mantra of the brand? It is about giving women confidence and dressing for themselves, really. I would say it is comfort. What could be more important for a woman for what's next to their skin? Also, what makes it so popular is that it doesn't have a back, so it fits so many different body types. I think a lot of women say, I'm to this, I'm to that. Is there an age that you can wear thongs? Well, we're wearing them. <laughs>don't you just love them? Well, Hanky Panky is celebrating the 35th anniversary of their iconic lace thong and recently unveiled their new logo that they say speaks to the heritage of Hanky Panky. The underwear company also prides themselves on using real women as models in every seasonal campaign. And just for our today viewers, they never really do this. Hanky Panky is offering 25% off with the promo code today. And I love a good throwback. Look at the packaging on this. Isn't that's so much fun. I actually remember what a tape recorder is. Just scan that QR code at the bottom of the screen for the deal. Just awesome. Well, coming up, an entrepreneur who was trying to solve her own skin problems and ended up creating something for all women. Stay with us. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. Yes, shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. We're going to kick off the Pink Power and Breast Cancer Awareness Month. What's the best thing about being this age? You have nothing to prove, because you already proved it. What does it feel like to be in a city that you love so much? I am humbly proud that I stuck up for my town. We all have the honor of helping reopen the doors. Broadway is back! Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! International Day of the Girl. The strength and courage of these women is remarkable. What's your message to girls who want to make a difference? Believe in yourself. You can make it happen. This isn't about spending going forward. This is about spending that's already happened. Do you accept the idea that we have a crisis at the border? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Well, this next story is one of my favorites and one I personally relate to. It's such a beautiful story. Coco Kind founder Priscilla Sai turned her biggest insecurity into a booming business. She struggled with skin problems for years, so made her own solution. And now she's sharing it with the world. Skin anxiety is very similar to body anxiety, and it's almost like the psychological effects are greater than sometimes the physical effects of, of having skin issues. Priscilla Sai and I have something in common, and it runs skin deep. So this story is really impactful for me because I grew up with really bad skin. It was called pizza face, didn't go to school, would cry in bed. When I think back, it was such a traumatic experience from my childhood. What do you remember about having bad skin from your childhood? 
I dealt with, you know, going to prom and trying to find a quote unquote like high back dress, um, which there are not a lot of. And so to me, it was about feeling like someone was not looking at me or seeing me, but instead just staring at my skin. Priscilla's insecurities followed her through school and into her first job on Wall Street. I was working like, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day and every morning I would just put on a ton of makeup using a brush and then I would go to work. I would do that same cycle during lunchtime because I would feel like my makeup was making me break out. I wouldn't go to lunch sometimes with my coworkers because of that. Priscilla spent her free time buying raw ingredients and mixing up her own formulas at home and eventually quit her job to create her own skincare line. Did you say to yourself, I know nothing about skincare except that I don't like mine. All right, I'm in finance, but I want to be in skincare. What was that first step? So at first, it's just about getting the knowledge and making sure I was talking to the right people, whether it was a chemist or a product developer, or business people to help me figure out what licenses do I need, what insurance do I need, basic things like that. Coco Kind officially launched in 2015 with five products, including a cleansing oil, skin butter, and lip balm. We launched a website, but you know, no one really comes to a website when they don't know who you are. She started by pitching her product to local Whole Foods stores, sending samples, and following up a lot. We actually got on the shelves of Whole Foods within like two months of quote unquote launching. And so that helped us get revenue immediately and pay for our next production runs. Today, Coco Kind is available in 5,000 stores nationwide, including every Whole Foods in the U.S. And Coco Kind has over 85,000 followers on TikTok. So when we launch a product that is helpful for acne, we show actually someone who has acne. Of course, we're not gonna show someone who has perfect skin and we're not gonna have these very unrealistic before and afters. We've all been there and we know that we're tired of that marketing. What would you say to that young girl out there watching who is struggling with skin issues now? I would say that you're beautiful and that skin is something that is so unique and the challenges that you face, you are not alone in that whatsoever. Now I look at my skincare journey and I realize like that's part of who I am and that's part of what make, makes my individual beauty so unique. She's amazing. Well, when we featured Coco Kind this summer, the team reported that they saw a 100% sales lift. So great. And Coco Kind is at it again. They just launched their AHA Jelly Cleanser. And you guessed it, they're offering an exclusive deal for our Today All Day viewers, 20% off with the code TODAY20. Well, next up, I'll introduce you to some incredible small businesses on my She Made It It list including the press on nail trend you'll want to try, plus the cutest mother-daughter matching PJ sets. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. In a mere 30 minutes. Oh, boom. That's good. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Grab your apron for a new podcast, Cooking Up a Storm with Al Roker. I forecast, yummy. Some of the best chefs spill the beans on family secrets to get you ready for Thanksgiving. This is fun. Bringing the heat for the holidays. Follow now wherever you get your podcasts. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it's just it.
Welcome back because I'm so jazzed to share my She Made It It list where I'm sharing some incredible small businesses I've had my eye on and I'm finally getting to share them with you. So all these businesses are female founded and are making waves in the beauty and fashion world, starting with 54 Thrones. 54 Thrones is an African brand that's inspired by the diversity and cultures of Africa and its people. Launched in 2016, the clean beauty brand is most known for its silky smooth and delicious smelling beauty butters and African oils. Its founder, Christina Fonke Tegbe, resigned from her job as a corporate consultant and embarked on what she calls an eat, pray, love journey, traveling to Africa to learn more about her Nigerian heritage. The prices start at $24. Really incredible. Next up, Aniche, a women's clothing brand designed to be worn before, during, and after pregnancy. Created by two moms and friends, Anisha Mugurji and Jessica Floman. During pregnancy, they were both disappointed by the lack of stylish clothing that could transition through all the stages of motherhood, so they did something about it. The prices start at $88. Next up, Chill House Chill Tips. Now these salon quality press on nail kits are such a hot trend right now. Apply them at home with no mess, no wait time, so you have more me time. Chill Tips was launched in August 2020 and comes from Chill House, a New York City modern spa co-founded by Cindy Ramirez Fulton. Cindy and her husband created the Chill House empire and set out to elevate the wellness experience. Chill Tips have doubled their sales every month since their launch and can now be found in over 350 stores nationwide. Prices start at $16. All right, last up, Polka Dot England. Debbie Cheneau and Rachel Cheneau Doniger are the mother-daughter team behind Polka Dot England. Known for their elevated women and children's loungewear and sleepwear that's so buttery, soft, and cozy. While everyone was home last year, business hit an all-time high, and the demand for loungewear, as we all know, increased in popularity. Kids' items start at $40, and women's pieces start at $72. They're pricey, but they are worth the investment. Remember to scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen to shop these small businesses. And we should mention, today gets a commission from your purchases. Well, that's all for our first She Made It show. Thanks for watching, and remember to shop these small businesses and get all the deals we showed you today. You can get them at today.com slash shop. I'm Jill Martin, and I'll see you next time with more fabulous females. Over the past year, four in 10 Americans have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder, and that's up from just one in 10 back in 2019. Yeah, and our good friend Rabbi Steve Leader knows those feelings all too well and is here today to talk about a very personal struggle. Steve is the senior rabbi at Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles and the author of an incredible book, 